That's what convinced me. I can, one of the reasons it carried on is because I knew it was coming from the highest brow people, some of them that I respect very much and others I don't respect, but I know that they, for personal reasons, they didn't want their orders to be overtaken, so they wrote about it or they leaked it, hoping you know for the best. The, they had uh, the, the Bavarian government and even the local prince who crushed the Illuminati in Bavaria wrote uh, two dozen letters or something about the Illuminati's presence and sent it to all his brethren in royal families in Europe. Those are on record. And, and I don't remember him saying in one of those, oh, they're all over and done with, you know, like we do today in the 20th century. He was warning his fellow royals because watch out, they're going to try and recruit you. They're still busy. We just suppressed them here in Bavaria, one small place, right? In Germany. Yeah, well, what about the rest of Germany? What about Austro-Hungary? What about Britain? What about Russia? So the man who knew about the Illuminati never once ever wrote about them disappearing. But today, plonkers in the 20th century, you're going to tell you there's no such thing as the Illuminati. Didn't we just mention people from the 10th century, the Knights Templars and the Hospitallers? The Knights Hospitallers who are sitting on the United Nations today as we speak are the oldest society in history, older than the Templars and older than the, the Cistercians. The Cistercians being way back as well. The Knights, of, the Knights Hospitallers that became the Knights of Malta are older. Don't let that confuse you when I said that they became the clerics later on. That was just, a, that was just in-house in-house decisions you know when the templar wealth was handed over but that the actual fact is that the, the hospitalers started before and they were called hospitalers because they did what open hospitals well that to me is it sends a shudder up my spine that's not a very good thing because these were guys were mendicants they were apothecaries uh-huh let's see where that road would lead you you're talking about you know today's uh, lockdown and the people behind it yeah the club of rome ever heard of them the Club of Rome is a global network of independent and renowned thinkers. The Club of Rome analyzes today's challenges facing the world, their root causes, and the possible futures in a systematic and holistic manner. The Club of Rome encourages global debate in order to set in motion actions that by the middle of the century will ensure a more secure, equitable, and prosperous world. Who and what is the Committee of 300? Well, I've dealt with that. I've told you this is a supranational body that knows no boundaries, respects the laws of no countries. The first time that they were publicly announced was by a German socialist by the name of Walter Rathenau. I'll give you some background of Walter Rathenau. He was the financial advisor to the Kaiser of Germany, and he was also the financial advisor to the Rothschilds, the French family Rothschilds. So he must have known what he's talking about. He made an astonishing statement in 1934. He said, there is a committee of 300 men that rule the world. They are known only to each other and nothing happens without their consent. The goals then very simply stated are to make the world over into a one world, new world order dictatorship controlled utterly and completely by this committee of 300. They do it by dint and by virtue of their fantastic wealth and the fact that they control thousands of the top banking institutions, the political organizations, insurance companies, but their strongest arm is called the Club of Rome. Now when I first heard of the Club of Rome in 1969, I immediately began my investigation and as Ken told you all of my investigations have been done on location every one of them the club of Rome is one of the most insidious baneful organizations in existence today which has done intolerable immeasurable harm to the United States of America this committee of 300 told a man called Aurelio Pecky to form this Club of Rome with the main object of bringing down the industries and the agricultural development of the United States. He immediately wrote a paper in which he said there are too many people on the earth and that the United States with its industrial development, its agricultural re development is responsible for this curse of overpopulation. I was able to, through my intelligence people, get a copy of this insidious document. 
basically what it said was that the middle class in the United States of America had to be destroyed because in the coming push to a world order, the middle class would be the stumbling block. The Club of Rome post-industrial zero growth paper said this has got to stop. We have to bring down the middle class of the United States. And the way that we will do this, the way that we will accomplish this task is by crushing their industries. The point I'm trying to make, ladies and gentlemen, is that the federal government, the secret upper level parallel government that runs the United States, does not want you to know that you have an upper level parallel government that calls the shots, that dictates what is going to happen to your life and mine. convinced me i can, one of the reasons that carried on is because oops sorry about that welcome everybody welcome back to the way of the truth warrior i hope you are well wherever you're watching this in the world i have an awesome show in store for you my good friend michael desarian reached out and he has some bombshells to give you regarding the club of rome that uh, that was dr john coleman by the way go check out that work that was a little clip from chapter one of cult of the medics you can get it over at cultofthemedics.com for free. You can watch it right now. I think this information is crucial in this particular time. And um, Michael's got some great information to share with you about ancient serpent symbolism, the Club of Rome. We're going to talk a little bit about that company, Gene and Tech. And this was all inspired by my recent interview with Dr. Artis. And so let me go ahead and bring Michael in and we're going to get his thoughts. So buckle up, my friends. Here we go. There he is. Michael, always good to see you, brother. How you doing? Um, hope you're yeah. well. I, you were talking about how you had checked out that interview. What was your first reaction to the information that Dr. Artis was breaking down there? Oh, just out of this world. Uh, rang true to me. Uh, when I got the symptoms of the disease, uh, I had a lot of uh, dreams of snakes. I felt poisoned. I felt it was a toxicology issue, especially with the tightness and the, like, the muscles were frozen. But actually, my unconscious started to have all of these weird snake dreams. Can you believe it? Really? And this was long before I heard his thesis. Yeah. That's really uh, interesting. Which is, uh, yeah, it is interesting in the sense, of course, it sounds unusual to people, but that's the way the body's intelligence works. The unconscious works that way. Uh, sometimes if you, if you pick up on it. So I thought that that was extraordinary. So when I saw that it said serpent, uh, you know, and again, that, in one way is no surprise because the serpent cult <clears throat> is one of the oldest in the world and uh his work dr artis's work proves it he has stumbled across hate to use that phrase but it'll fit for now that he has come across research that shows what's really been going on here with the medics and how they have uh, poisoned the whole human race here and also deceived us into thinking it's virology when it's actually toxicology and this is a no brainer to any toxicologist who looks at the side effects of what's been going on. So it will get traction and it is definitely going to come forth, but it highlights what we're interested in also is the occult aspect. And you're right. So Dr. John Coleman is, is a genius and his two books, diplomacy by deception and uh, committee of 300 must be in everyone's, uh, bookshelf, both those books because of how brilliant they are and they're concise because he did know what he was talking about. He is one of the first to mention the club of Rome. I know that Eustace Mullins did. That's probably where I heard of it, but I think I've been into Dr. Coleman's work since the nineties and, uh, had read it so assiduously uh, and then, you know, G. Edward Griffin and others like that, <coughs> because remember G. Edward Griffin did the capitalist conspiracy and it, <coughs> Right. But he did other documentaries exposing the medics. So there's a bevy of people out there who've been onto this uh, and uh, the Club of Rome's role. But on lists that I had that have long since been taken from the internet, 
the Club of Rome membership sh surely showed that there were Templars, that they were uh, Knights of Malta, uh, and that the American government is overwhelmingly controlled by the Knights of Malta, you know, with your heads of CIA and uh, the Skull and Bones connection. Wherever you find a Skull and Bones connection, you'll find Knights of Malta. Wherever you find Opus Dei, you'll find Knights of Malta. They're all considered Catholic organizations, but that's, again, false. They own, you know, Catholic, Catholicism is just a mere marquee out front. So the good little Catholic boys and girls will imagine that these are philanthropic organizations that your money contributes to and all, and won't ever go anything deeper than that. But obviously their antiquity alone and the fact that I keep bringing out is they, they were allied with some of the most bizarre, sinister groups in the Middle East, you know, out of the time of the Crusades. These Knights Templar were assigned and aligned with some very, very powerful groups like the Italian Mercs and the, the Amalfi and also the uh, Silesian Pirates. And mm -hmm. that is why the skull and bones use that skull and bones because that's what you find on bottles of poison in medicine because it comes from groups who knew all about that and uh that symbol has carried over to represent those who are mendicants basically now that hasn't wasn't tied in to a lot of other people's research so in origins and oracles i think uh i do mention the pirate the pirates and their connection you know uh at the time is mentioned the connection to groups like the Bacardi, right? Because alcohol, remember, if you look at the master chronology in the back of the Atlantis book, it's not just uh, uh, drugs or whatever, uh, it's sugar, it's caffeine, and it's alcohol and tobacco as well uh, as mercury. And, and those, uh, so the same group deals in, in, you can call them the opium trade traders or whatever, but they go back for a very, very long time through the pirates and all the way back. And the pirates were there to move the contraband around. And also to make sure that insurance, uh, Dr. John Coleman always mentions the insurance companies. The insurance companies basically started with the Italian merchants. And the Italian merchants, in order to get the trade, would just blow anyone else out of the water. They hired groups that we now know as the pirates to wait for, you know, in the mist or to wait at a particular island to attack. And, and uh, they'd wave it. They'd have, a, they'd have a flag and the flag was red. So when you see these bankers and these other groups with the red flag or the bono, that toss pot right or anytime that red square comes up it's a sign of danger used first by pirates italian merchants to stop a ship and to warn it we're coming aboard to check your inventory we might take our, our cut and if you even showed the slightest resistance up went the the skull and bones you know uh, uh and then they would board you and massacre you and the, Isn't that the, the origin of false flag? Like false flag, yeah. you put a false flag That's up, it. and then whoosh, yeah. here comes the poison. And you can look it up. You can yeah. look it up on on Wikipedia. Everything I'm saying, um, and that was your doom. So somebody who's highly literate. These pirates were not just what you know the swashbuckling films show. They were actually all uh, trained in mil maritime academies, highly uh, and funded by the princes, the black Italian, the black nobility that Joseph, uh, that uh, John Coleman calls them. I just call them the uh, Italian mercs. Because that then, don't you see, the word Merck has the double meaning of being into medicine as well, because Merck was a very famous company. And also the logo of the serpent and the staff is Mercury. right? And Mercury oh is a God. substance right. as well yeah. as a god and all the rest of it. We can, one can unpack that endlessly. Actually, it's not a male symbol at all. We'll get into that later. Um, it's not a brotherhood of the snake we're talking about. It's a sisterhood. And that makes you, if that doesn't make you quiver, I don't know what does. But the men were out front, even back in those medieval days, even back at the Crusades. Uh, the men who ran Jerusalem, even if they were Templars, all were known, their full titles involved a female, not just Mary either. And even the Mary they're talking about is really Mary Magdalene, who's of the bloodline, the Parthian French bloodline, not Mother Mary. You see, so there's a female connection. And when you study the Italian circle, uh, this becomes quite obvious. But we maybe can leave that for another for a minute or two so because so the so the so the, the skull and bone symbol that is used think of all the symbols why is a pirate symbol being used on the ivy league secret society hmm. uh in yale university i mean there has to be a connection well it is and some people have traced it to german lodges but that's uh you know you need to do your homework the logo is telling you something more the uh number 
And so when these gangs would uh, board you, they would kill you all off if you resisted, because then that was a message to everybody else. So when we fight, show our flag, the skull and bones or the red flag, different different captains did it different ways, and they would know. And you couldn't forge it because moon letters or what do they call these things? The uh, uh, on the parchments that you would show, they'd have this. Uh, the hell are those things called? The watermarks. Watermarks yeah. play a, a yeah. big role in this. Uh, secret societies. Anyway, watermarks and secret societies go together, right? Well, they knew that some captain, smart, wily captain, couldn't forge some papers. The pirates would always know to look and see the watermark to know it's, in fact, authenticated. But what the captains of the ships never realized is these pirates work for the people, you, the, the insurance company you're signed up with. Wins both ways. And you will now sign with them, you see, because all of the ships for the first period that never got insurance now go back port to port empty. A lot of their people killed and all the all of the different th stuff stolen. Yeah, do you know who's sending them? The insurance company. The pirates work for the insurance oh, yeah. company that are the Club of Rome, you know, antecedents, the Knights of Malta, the Knights of Rhodes. And that's why Rhodes and Malta are in the Mediterranean, because their first trade of these people was on the Mediterranean and the high seas. We know them as pirates today, but they didn't go away. And they came over to America long ago with a Skull and Bones organization. And they're not the only ones either. A lot of the banking uh, mercs have that. <coughs> they moved as well. But their universal symbol is the serpent, as you showed at the very opening here, the caduceus as it's called. Now that shows you that serpents must matter. Where did that symbol itself come from? I know where it comes from. But the thing is, the symbol itself turns up in, you know, it's, it was known as the ne Nehuashtan and Nehushtan of the Hebrews, allegedly in the Bible, that Moses is meant to have erected in the desert, uh, in the wilderness. But, uh, as, and that sounds similar to Nahash, which is another Hebrew word referring to the serpent or the symbol of the serpent. And that's where most people leave it. Uh, but, but clever people say, what on earth would Moses be doing with a brazen standard where did that come from it just comes out of the bible it's not a hebrew symbol it's not a symbol in fact i think in greek mythology zeus is the only god not associated with a serpent here's a whole pantheon and mm. i'm just talking about greek it means rome too zeus was the only god that didn't have a serpent as a tutelary symbol or in somewhere in the name or the mythos of that deity from childhood there wasn't a story of a serpent or a clear identification even the Titans are identified with them, the Olympiads, you know, and all of this. That's how common the symbol was to the gods. Gods and serpents go together. So why are the mercs? Why are these people using that symbol? I want an explanation. In fact, I finally wanted an explanation for all the symbols that these people were using. And you're quite right. When I lived in the Bay Area for nearly 18 years, one of the first things I ever did and did extensively was to drive around with a camera, either on my bike, push bike, and sometimes in a car and photograph all the Silicon Valley logos. Silicon Valley logos. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Genentech being one of the biggest companies there that Dr. Artis mentions was uh, one of the biggest. I think I can still visualize their headquarters, you know, and as long as you're on the footpath or driving on the public road, none of their security buffins can do anything about it. So I got away with it. And also I'd go at an off time, you know, when everybody's gone to work, I wouldn't go around when the places were open. And Genentech jumps to mind because it was one of many uh, that I noticed had these serpent symbols. The, see, the gene symbol, the DNA spiral, is really a euphemized, the serpent caduceus is a euphemized genetic strand. Now, I didn't put it there. I didn't put it there. So somebody did. Somebody has made a connection between an old ancient symbol of the mendicants and the genetic. Well, that's not just some designer coming up with that, because that has occult origins, as many things do, like the comets that appear too often on Masonic tracing boards, the references to a blazing star that everybody who studies masonry knows, but nobody can tell you what the blazing star is. Look, they're telling you. And then they go, well, it's just a caduceus of Hermes. All right, then tell me how Hermes got connected with medic medicine. Where's that connection from? And, and so on and so on it goes, all right? Or the shield. And the fact that the caduceus is often seen on a shield 
these are occult symbols and they don't mean good but uh, some homework then shows you the connection to these templars because the the knights of malta who just slightly precede them were called their full title is called the knights of saint john a hospitaller now what and the hell that, is all that doesn't that connect i was going to ask you this because you you brought up that that's that kind of blows my mind that reminding us about the symbol of the skull and bones the fact that it's at yale the connection to the pirates which it's not the Johnny Depp pirates, happy go lucky, rum chugging. That's that's all for Hollywood. The real pirates were mercenaries hired by royalty and the black nobility and these banking fraternities, etc., secret societies. They were the agents, they were the provocateurs. That's the old the first uh version of Antifa and these kind of groups, I guess, but like on a higher level. And then you've got Yale University that we've got numerous presidents in the United States that are admitting openly that they were part of these groups. And some people have said that that skull to them is the skull of John the Baptist. Uh, you've said that it's actually something to do with the, uh, another female goddess cult, but that whole John the Baptist cult is probably linked to that as well. But just as you said that, wasn't the Knights of Malta originally their progenitors were the Benedictines, which would have been a John the Baptist sort of cult? Isn't there a connection there? Yeah. Oh, there's always a connection. They don't hide that. It's not John the Beloved. We'll get to him in a minute. It's John the Baptist. And that connects mm -hmm. to a non-Christian sect of Mandians. Who, if anything, were Gnostics or whatever, right? <coughs> and also connects, there's been connections to the Essenes. And the Essenes are not Gnostics. They're just hardline Jews. But there is a, you know, we could get into the whole thing. It's not that interesting, really. There's a Natanist connection and other connections. But basically, if it's John the Baptist, then there's that Mandean connection. And the Mandeans are sort of Gnostics, Christians, uh, almost wiped out. And not just them, but other groups as well. There's a whole bunch of these groups. And so their affiliations have been noted, but I find them all to be inadequate. The, group that, the groups that I've just mentioned are the ones that they were connected to. They had to. They couldn't survive it. All that nonsense about going out and fighting Saracens. They were in with the fucking Saracens. And when they were in with them, I mean, the elite, the elite were. Right. While the Holy War was going on, they had to get in contact with Jews, Jews who were helping the Knights Templar, helping the Christians. And that's been documented. In fact, it's documented that uh, Jews accompanied some of the leading Templars back to France. There, there's all of that, you know, this idea of Peter the Hermit. And, and uh, in fact, uh, the Jewish connection really is the Merovingian connection because the king of the Merovingians was called Hooknose because of his Semitic looks. And th therefore, the Benjaminites is the one to look for there. A very unusual group that is really a bunch of Atmists under a different name. You know, they, they, they hide themselves, right? And there's all of that to speak about. But that's a female cult because the Benjaminites merged in with the people that we know as the Franks, who are not French, but German. And they are, the, the Merovingians ruled over them for about 250 years or something like that. And then that group moves into France and becomes the famous Merovingians. And they're devils. These are utterly evil people. And they have a Judaic connection, but it's it's not Judaic. It's set in an atheist once you really peel off, you know, the different research that people have done. And I'm grateful for their research. But uh, St. John is, been, is, is no question... You know, Picnet and Prince, some of the great books, definitely show you that the Templar connection is not as much to the Essenes as it is to these Mandeans and Gnostic sects. Now, John the Baptist then is the uh, leader of those sects, is, is the way they sort of look at it, right? And he, he died by being beheaded, whereas St. John the Divine, the other St. John of the Bible, died by poison or didn't. He was handed a chalice of poison. They knew he was one of the 12, and they were trying to execute them and get rid of them. But magically, he was able to say, this chalice, I, I see the poison in it, and did something magical. And a snake appeared and coiled itself around the cup. So the symbol of St. John the Divine, and I don't know how these symbols, who the hell knows how they transmogrify, but hmm. the symbol of St. John, the divine, the, the disciple of Jesus, is a chalice with a snake around it, showing poison, snake poison. You know, connecting the two, because from time antiquity, all, even if this only tells us one thing, it tells us that snakes and poison have been known 
you know, in biblical times and of course from before. Yeah, but all this again, bio it's just weapon, interesting that all this poison. Yeah. yeah. And it just seems that if you look most of our female Illuminati program, that seven hour program, the first part is all about the women cults who were the experts in serpent poison because they used to add it in with the uh, poppy seeds and other things as well. Maybe we would go into that at great length because my theories led me to realize then this is not a brotherhood of the snake at all. It's a dry, it's a sister hood. That's the dragon court. So what your John Coleman's missed and all of this is that they see the men that are out front because that's just the knightly way. A knight comes from a word, a French word, uh, that means a servant, all mm -hmm. right, which it should tell us everything. And then, you know, their long hair and all the rest of it. And then the skull, like you said, when it actually was done, DNA came along, this famous Templar skull was a female skull. So, uh, you know, all of these things can be put together. And that led then to the uh, Order of Sion, <coughs> who is the steering group behind the uh, Templar's orders. Not a twin group but a, a more you know, advanced group of these women apothecaries who had kept the secrets of the herbs because you can keep the secret of the herbs for healing, but a witch is obviously defined by somebody who knows what the other ones will do. At the very least, drive you fucking mad, suck away your willpower, uh, you know, give you crushing illnesses, uh, you know, and then this would be used by the Merovingian types I just mentioned before anytime they wanted to depose somebody they didn't like. So you just be dead, died in agony. So they removed any enemies and have been doing that up until modern day. Now we're the enemy. So the people have been doing this. So the connection to the Johns is a bit tenuous, but I wanted to point out the, the bridge there that one of them has a chalice of a serpent and was nearly poisoned. And the other one is the John the Baptist, who is definitely the tutelary icon, you know, uh, of the Knights Templar and the Knights of Malta, they just changed their name to the Knights of St. John Hospitaller. And that then leads you into the whole nightmare of it because the Club of Rome, Opus Dei, all of them, the Knights of Columbus, they're all one group. It's not just that there's one Knights of Malta. And you can prove this for yourself because when you take the symbol of the Maltese cross that they use, you'll find that on many a church, um, sorry, many a uh, hospital up in San Francisco, you know, go and look at them and you'll find some Mary's church. You'll see the Knights of Malta, uh, Pate cross. The very idea that doctors used to wear the white robes, the white, you know, see, is all based in their symbolism. See, mm -hmm. you're born in white and you die in black. Right? Well, that's the Knights right. Templar symbols. They got you at both fucking ends, dude. You don't think, you don't know nothing about secret societies. You're born to the white coated Templar and you die when they haul you ass into the graveyard in black. Somebody knows something about symbolism, I'll tell you. And both are done in the hospital, yeah, right? So the basically. medics take you cradle to grave, and they don't mind if you reach your grave quicker. Oh, they, in fact, they assure you will. They, they're, see, they're already responsible for genocide by taking away the holistic. <clears throat> we'll have a, <clears throat> a show on this next week, or on Sunday. But by removing the positive power of herbs, and uh, poisons and whatever to make you immune and to heal you. And there's no question that secret societies used snake venom, as we point out in female Illuminati for transportative, spiritualistic, uh, it was homeopathic. So by suppressing any of the homeopathic stuff, uh, you know, they already condemned you to agonizing death on the stuff that they are producing. The thing is, obviously logic tells you that for in order to know what different serpent venoms do to you, your organs, and just you, takes thousands upon thousands of years. This is not something that came out of the 15th century, or you know Louis Pasteur and and that mm. fucking uh, Dr. Jenner. Yeah. No, 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 they've been you know God knows what was being pulled up at the back doors of that Genentech. If you tried to pry too clearly, you'd suddenly be gone. You know, disappeared. Right? Yeah. Venom, snake, snakes, when they would go and, you know, take the king cobras and these uh, black mambas and find out what it's doing to you. But obviously, since that was in the world, like I say, in the, in the biblical times, they already knew of the connection. But then that knowledge comes from before, because you can go back to the earliest times and find out that snake venom, you know, amongst other things, was being used for criminal purposes. So then this thing goes way back. And if you take my Atlantis theory, then it goes back to the time 
uh, when genetics was spliced. They were using pigs. Mm. They were using uh, animals of this earth. Yeah, that's where the hybrids came from that everybody else gets wrong, right? Uh, you know, these minotaurs and centaurs. Welcome, which is the brother company of Genentech, Welcome, have a black horse. It's actually a unicorn, but the black horse is Kabbalists. So they're secret societies. You can't, I can't tell you how many secret societies use the symbol of a black horse or some hybrid animal like that. Yale, look up Yale in, the, in, the, in, a, in a bestiary. It's a hybrid creature, part goat, part something else. So why this fixation on hybrid animals? Because they know what, you know, they're playing with etymology, they're playing with symbolism. But the black horse in Italian is Kabbalah. Kabbalist, so it means it's a double, it's a, it's a double symbol. And Welcome has a black horse. And they're in connection with, they're the parent company of Genentech. So these are all Italian mafia, all Ita but you know, the real thing, the real thing at the top. And AB, Astra, and Merck, there was actually, it was a company called Merck. Now you have Pfizer, Moderna, whatever, what have you. They're all just branches of the same rotten club of Rome that administrates for them. And you guarantee if you dig deep, you'll find out that there's nothing but Knights of Malta or other Catholic orders involved with these pharmaceutical companies. You know, that still remains to be brought up by somebody, but it's difficult, right? You know, because we're on the outside and they're not. But the the money that's involved, the billions of dollars, the kind of research, the antiquity of the kind of research, and just these spurious connections. And then you're finding all of these poisons in the blood of people who claim to have fucking COVID, right? And all this. So, and not just that, it's been going on for a long, long time. Because and there would that be connection, multiple... like I said, the chalice of St. John. Right. And there would be multiple delivery system options for them. And they would know exactly how to do it because everybody's fighting. Oh, yeah. with, when I brought Dr. Artis on, I got a slew of emails. Most of them were nurses and doctors going, oh, my God, it makes so much sense. But I, you get those ones and, and everybody's out there trying to debunk them and take them down and all this. But the reason they're saying it is they're like, oh, they, they wouldn't be able to put it in the water. There's not enough snake venom and all this. And it's like, no, it's synthetic snake peptides that were isolated and there could have been it's multiple. homeopathic. Yeah. Right. And, and that's the other thing is he's still trying to, he's like, I don't know all the answers. We're just finding it. And, um, and instead of everybody jumping on him, it'd be like, well, why don't you get into it? Because what I want people to know is just how sophisticated at the, just to think of the modern time, the self-sophisticated, these biologic, biological warfare facilities are these, this gain of function research we're hearing about. That's not new. That's not something that just jumped up because of Anthony Fauci. Um, it, it, this, what you're saying is these guys are apothecaries. They're elite apothecaries that know exactly how to do this in ancient times, in modern times. They just have a lot more technology now that, yeah, if we take your Atlantis theory, they're just recovering that tech. They're not, that was already in place well before Egypt, but they're, they're in the process of recovering it and then rolling it out and, so, and making right. it more sophisticated. So there could be multiple delivery systems. And what are they spraying out of these planes? Where if they think about even the stuff you go, you go to the grocery store, you buy your leaf lettuce and your vegetables, well, where did it come from? What water system are they using to spray it every 20 minutes in the grocery store? What water sprinkler systems are they using on the farmland? What kind of chemical products through Bayer, which bought Monsanto, right? And Bayer has a connection to IG Farben. I'd showed that. What what kind of chemicals are being sprayed on all the farm fields? And even if you're an organic farm sitting next to a, a non-organic farm, well, you think the wind doesn't blow that crap all over your quote unquote organic crops. And then that gets into the soil and that changes the genetic structure of the soil. And then what, what are you doing? You're eating food that comes from animals, from plants, fruit trees. H how do you know what the dis dissemination is? What, and then, yeah, what, what we just watched that, uh, I was watching that Batman film. The whole thing is about how they jump, they jump a bunch of poison in the water supply of Gotham City, and then they aerosolize it with this sonic beam weapon, and then everybody goes mad. Like it, they're telling you all over the place. Yeah. So let your imagination go. And yeah, we got to hunt these guys down and get the specifics, but we are tracking a predator that, in one sense, likes to show itself and brag through the symbols and tell you in the shows and the movies. And then in the other sense, they're hiding a lot of this stuff. And then I say to some of these doctors, these well-intentioned doctors that, you know, they've been trained by this cult. They were brought up and raised to think like this. The science alone, the scientism alone is already bankrupt. 
the way they view the body, their fundamental principles of reality and the origins of the human species. You're bought the foundations of the very cult that you've a lot of these doctors walked away from during COVID to expose the gross violations of science that they saw. And God bless them. But now they're going to attack a doctor artist because this is just too far out for them. But I'm sorry, guys, you know, you got to think a lot of these doctors are experts in one or two fields max, which means they're compartmentalized, right? right? And then they're not going to take in the occult angle of this stuff. They're not, they don't think like that. They were raised. They're not members of the club. There you go. There you go. Yeah. You know, pesticides, ever heard of them? Yeah. I'm going to really go over and start digging around. It's a pesticide. Don't touch it. So, you know, nobody's going to come out there to some guys where the pesticides are kept. And dig around to find out what's ingredients of it. You you listen to whatever the company that sells it to you is saying it is. And of course, when I alluded quite humorously there about what's happening at the back doors of Genentech, yeah, I, I, it was only partly humor. They breed the fucking snakes. They've got enough of them. You can breed them, you know, like rats, all over the world. You can have special laboratories. You can synthesize it. You can home make it homeopathic. So of course, you have plenty of you know, of the actual substance. And remember, some of this stuff is so utterly lethal. And now they have the genetic way to synthesize it and uh, multiply it. So target that's not been the problem. Yeah, they, they, they use target groups. <clears throat> that's all been whistleblown in films. And I take what I see in those films very, very literally because it ties in with the old mythologies. They're still using the same symbolism. In ritual, you have to show the victim right in front of his fucking face what he's dying of. It's the mark right it's the mark so the very guy coming in with the logo you know and the white used to be the white coat now they've got themselves dressed up like a bunch of fucking aliens right but the, the original symbolism is all you need the red cross or the black cross and those are templar symbols all the way uh based on factors you know that they use uh blood the red cross is of course blood and the black cross is obviously occult right so they're just they're just the same thing that the pirates did before and they work in league with the insurance companies because in order they're going to say to you in part of the ritual if you want to save yourself you either join our order or you go and take out insurance uh, you know uh, and lean, lean against your death right so you're still coming all the way back to us that's the way they do things right that all roads lead to rome all roads lead to now rome is not fucking rome rome is mithra get it you know, it, it, the whole bloody place sits on top of a couple of temples to Mithras. But Mithras is not man. The word Mithra in Persian is female. And and that is only the son, as it always is, of the mother, Sabel. And Sabel is where we get Kabela or Kabbalah. So the whole yeah. thing goes back to female uh, symbolism. Uh, she is the great mother of the teeming womb. Who can take you back anytime you fucking want because that's the ritual and these boys these bald head fuckers they just bow their fucking castrated heads and go that's it you are the great mother now we'll hide all of that in the ways i've so pointed out for so long i'm getting fucking tired of it right but the symbolism the caduceus is not a male symbol it actually comes from a group called the great royal wives we went into this in the in the female illuminati and they are the dragon court so there is actually no such thing as a dragon brotherhood or a Brotherhood of the Snake. It can be used because they're acolytes. They're on the art side. They do the functioning, right, uh, of conquering the world in the name of the symbol that they use. Now, that symbol, the Nehashtuan, is uh, a symbol that doesn't come from the Hebrews. That's why it's all a bit more bizarre. Until you look into the authors like Sigmund Freud, who said, ah, but Moses came from Egypt. Well, yeah, we do know that story. Yeah, but more so. Might have even been a pharaoh. Or a pharaoh's brother. I mean, does, do you really want to nitpick over it? That's already so high up the bloody ladder from what we know about the biblical character. That whether he was Akhenaten or Tothmosis doesn't really matter. Can we agree on that? The thing is already so blasted out into space, right? Your your theory. Right. So then he could put that symbol up. But wait a minute. No, I'm the one who's gone further and say, no, no male can raise that symbol. No, 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 no male. The only reason a male could raise the symbol of uh, the Nehashtuan is because he's a member of a secret society that's run by women. Well, that kind of a little bit stretches it. But wait a minute. If Akhenaten died and his daughter took over, and we know who, who she is, right, and where she's buried, 
Well, then she could buy rights. Raise it. And the definition was that it would that the holy people were being attacked by snakes. So they raised the brazen serpent to stop them being attacked by snakes, little snakes, little bites. Right? Now what that to me is that there was polit that's a just a metaphor for political falling out in the female cult. Now I've held to that since day one that Akhenaten's daughter was a breakaway cult. That's why Nefertiti's never been discovered. They were enemies. And uh, there was such strict rules about who could take over. In fact, such strict rules that the pharaoh couldn't become pharaoh without the great royal wife being his wife. That's why they're called the great royal wives. You were you couldn't get above prince head level unless the right great royal wife took you and married your ass. And that was by dint of her order. Nothing male about it. Situman was the great royal wife that married Akhenaten, not Nefertiti. So Nefertiti was considered an external accumbrance, more like a mistress. She was never really uh, accepted. And the only reason she was accepted is that she was probably Scythian by birth, as the daughter was. Now that's high. So they have their own highness. They have their own pedigree. And fuck me, that is not a small one, because actually it's, it all goes back to the Scythians. All this herbalism that we're talking about, all goes back to the female branch of the of the Scythians. Now we know them as the Amazons, but there's more to that story than can ever be gone into. So my guess is, and not just mine, but other historians have thought that they were from the West. They have Western ancestry. They did, and so they decided, who the fuck are you, great royal wives? You know the whole story is told in female Illuminati to tell us who the fuck isn't. My mother was married to Akhenaten, right? So fuck you, right? And so they broke away. And the symbol of their breakaway, Atnas sect, is the moment when the standard was raised in the desert, you know, which cannot be explained through any mosaic or any Judaic symbolism. What's, in fact, it's an affront. You do get the tribes having different symbols, and there is one that has a serpent, but it's not a, a caduceus. It's not a, a you know a double serpent or anything like that. And had it been incorporated as one of the symbols of the... Well, see, the, the tribes actually didn't really exist until they get back to Jerusalem and set up you know their nations there and then you get them sort of that tribal thing coming back but if it was one of the tribes like the tribe of dan or i can't remember the one that has the serpent it would have been said clearly that that, that this is the reason for the uh, you know the raising of the brazen standard but there's no such mention that the tribes were dividing in the wilderness or that one particular tribe had just taken over you don't get that until way way later in the time of the kings and anyway, simple symbolism tells you who the double serpent was. It's a goddess symbol all the way. And it was the tutelary symbol of the great royal wives, the dragon court. And the great royal mm -hmm. wives are the original mendicants, the ones who did, the, who are descended from the old queens of old, who fucked with our DNA in the very, very beginning. This is a super cult of, of great royal wives, the ones that really matter, uh, the ones that you go to when you want somebody poisoned. You see... And these are then a special group who have all sorts of private worship. And they were so powerful that no king could rule Egypt without their say-so. And that's one of the reasons that Akhenaten fell, actually. You'll, you'll never hear people go into that because this great war of wives has been scrubbed. You really got to do some homework, you know, to find out about their existence and how utterly, absolutely powerful they were. And then you get into the whole thing, you know, of the anointing of a pharaoh and how the different represent they representatives of the goddess are sent and representatives of the great royal wives they ruled egypt and you get to see them in the tower deck in cards two and three that's who they are the both the positive yeah. side and the negative side you see the motherly side that married which is the venusian version of all women yeah and the priestess who's the occult hidden somewhat dangerous side of the same being that's why the cards two and three you know uh because there's that a one dual aspect there's a dual aspect to and, the power female and then that but would they be, just see it as a, even more going back to an ancient goddess who says the world is my huh? oh it looks like there's a slight delay uh, let me see here can you hear me okay michael oh you're breaking up now i'm breaking up hope everybody can hear me in the chat um yeah michael maybe pop out and pop back yeah, in just to you. Okay. No. Just, yeah, just you pop out, pop back in. There. There's a there's a delay. Okay. It just slowed down all of a sudden. Yeah. Let's try that. If you just jump out, jump back in. 
uh, maybe close down your browser, open it up again, and then come in. That should help. Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. We'll get him back. Uh, what I was going to bring up there, this is fascinating. Okay. So when we get Michael started on this, there's so many places to go. I'll ask him about it when he comes back, but there's one element of when you check out. So by the way, the female Illuminati presentation where he gets into all these witch coven and Royal wife cults and the serpentine cults going all the way back. Um, he gets into a lot of this with the symbolism and the true history of it. Here we go. Let's try this again. There we go. Can you hear me better now? Okay, good. Doesn't seem there's a delay. Yeah, it seems all right. I, I was just going to ask you about um, breaking up. Oh, I'm still breaking up. Yeah. So these uh, the no. Go ahead. Oh no, I think you're good. Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, yeah, these great royal wives then haven't gone away, and so they're the power behind the throne. Right. And they're the ones who first looked into herbalism. They were the first one. This has all been proven, by the way. You can go back to almost Paleolithic times, let low, you know, just like the Bronze Age, and find all sorts of accoutrements showing that women measured the stars. They have these measuring sticks, and that those became the first uh, division of the uh, season. Uh, and then this then finally became the planting season. They found the, the seed sticks or whatever they're called to show that precise measurements were done by the women so that they would know exactly when to harvest. And that's where the original witch story comes out of, you know, which was just a nothing sinister about it in the early days. But of course, then this was taken up. We've had millennia. We've literally had since almost Stone Age times, the cultivation of poppy seeds, opium, and what have you, and, so, and things infinitely like Bella, Belladonna. We went into it in all the female Illuminati program. After watching that, there can be no doubt, because then I lead up to show the Masonic symbolisms as all female. And so the skull is female. I mean, what more do you want, right? There's a lot of female symbolism there, far, far more than is required. Because they also, if you go to that link I sent and scroll down, you'll see the woman and the serpent. A great deal of this is... Yeah, just go down to the bottom. Is whistleblown to us. Now well, there's the comment aspect. Maybe you can talk about that. But yeah, if you go down to the very bottom pictures, there's a good page people can look at uh, called Serpent Symbolism. And so St. John, there's St. John with a chalice. I think there's a couple. Yeah, this is the initiation symbol of being born again from the mother. But the mother is in the form of a sea serpent. Nothing sinister about it. It's part of their rituals whether it's a Mithraic rituals or other rituals. There you go. That's St. John with his chalice. Just I find very interesting that the name John, you know, be connected to poison and you see the serpent. Absolutely. And this symbol of the chalice and the serpent is often used by medical people today. Go down. Yeah, I remember we talking to Gary Wayne about that and he brought that up as well. Um, so all the way at the bottom, let me start. Oh, yeah. here we go. <laughs> There's that. Okay, so a go up to the next one. Go to the one. Yeah. 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 So th they're telling you, and I'm not ashamed to tell you that a lot of what I know comes from looking at ad copy. The red haired symbol, the red haired lady is the mother, and the serpent is the pet, the son, the child. That's why you can have this. She's got her eyes closed. She's not in any fear. That's a baby. That's a child. That's her son. That's her acolyte. They're the serpent dragon cult, and they have, it's a female order. So the one below, the stinking rotten witch bitch. Who needs to be fucking disemboweled. This woman is again just one of a whole cult of people that's still around. So people can go to this uh, and check it out. That's why they use the symbol. Think for a minute. Think for a minute. What the fuck is the symbol about? Why do you keep seeing it on that copy? A woman and a serpent or a python. And python is the python of Delphi, which was a female oracle. So the oracles always used to use the serpent piss. Right? to get out of their fucking skull so they could predict something for the Caesar. Otherwise, he was going to get pretty fucking unhappy if he lost any more fucking wars. So he'd go, to the, he'd go skeptically to these oracles, and they shit, and you know, they didn't want to be shit out of luck. And then one of the most powerful, there was many groups, in Rome, they were called the Sibylline Oracles. And 
there were oracles. There were actually books written in blood, written in you know cork or written in skin, and they were kept for thousands of years. You can look it up, Sibylline oracles. And the whole book of Revelation is the Sibylline oracles rescripted. Every line, all that shit about 666 and the, the beast, that is a pathetic rendering of a word, of a number, 616. It, the, the fuckers are so drunk or they couldn't even get it right, these Christian lunatics. And do you know how many evangelists go ra rabbit on about? Yeah, there you go. So 616 in Gematria, original Gematria, just meant Caesar. So it had nothing to do with prophecy. These were pathetic groups who, in order to not be beheaded by the Caesar, had to come up with some. And mostly the Caesar's wife was the one that was heading over there, just like Yoko Ono today, you know. It was the Caesar's wives who wanted prophecy. So these Sibylline oracles, who once were great, but as time you know degenerated, as time passed by, they've just became a bunch of fucking cheats and liars. And that's why uh, Rome had so many emperors and Caesars, one you know after the other. And some of them didn't even last more than a couple of months. Yet they all were going to seek counsel from the Sibylline oracles, but they had lost their fucking power. So then they start taking these heavily heavy duty, you know, psychotropics. Right, a lot of it coming out of like using venom in the wild hope that they would, uh, you know, Monty Palmer Hall goes into all of this. Right, in his book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, you can check it out. So the, the Pythoness, she was called the Pythoness. I'm just trying to give you allusions to women and serpents. Right? And they knew the secret. So they upgraded it as their official status fell. These Demetrian women started to realize that they still can retain power in terms of uh, people's ill health. Right? It's like a domesticated thing, right? As a nurse. And so the thing then spiraled out of control where you have your sort of you know hansel and gretel type witch who knew that by administering sweets how obvious going to get right uh administering the sweet stuff you could then you know <coughs> you that's the carrot on children the and you could seduce yeah you know, exactly. it's all there it's all there for the trained eye you know and the trained uh, so in the symbolism today these women still identify themselves with the serpent And you see the man, you see a Shepelus, you know, but behind him is Hygieia, you see. So the female is always going to be there in, in, in this. And they are able to take our lives because they literally believe that the goddess that we don't serve anymore, she's pissed anyway. And secondly, whether she's pissed or not, we all come from her womb. All the gods are born from the womb of Isis or whatever, right? And uh, Isis had to use the men to, you know, use her apothecary skills and her magical skills to resuscitate resuscitate uh, Osiris. So you can use the same power for good or for evil. It's the way they're ritualistic aspects. Look at it, you know. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, I was just showing here, I'll pop it up again as you were talking. Look at this, the companies, these are Silicon Valley companies and Oracle, you know, it's right there in your face. Yeah. They'll just say it. There's also um, some of these companies named Astral and like if you just really look at the symbols and the, like look at Intel, like this is a, what's this? A pattern of a, of a star, a plant pattern of, of Venus, you know, it's yeah. Microsoft, the four squares, right? The serpent, Amazon, they, right? They've got a company there called Cygnus. Most of the names of the companies I noticed had some stellar uh, symbolism, uh, mm. Pentium. Yeah. That's an old one. They they copyright these names from the Greek and the Latin and the occult languages, but they also copyright the symbolism that goes with it. Uh, yeah, I mean, but look, even Coke and Pepsi have Typhon, the Typhonian beast. The Typhonian beast is Set, or a version of Set, depending on the cult that worship them, you see. Uh, Set is Sutek, Tech, Su Tech, Jinen Tech. You see, the genes are always a euphemism for the serpent. And the splitting of the DNA, I'm still one of the only people, not the only one, but advocate clearly in my works how old that is. Others have written on it, but many years later, right? Uh, your Zacharias Hitchens and your Von Dunikens all accepted in the 70s that genetic manipulation, Brinsley Lepore Trench is the guy I read, 
So I picked up on that. But rather than them thinking that it was some beneficent force. Yeah, look at that. The symbol of the sunrise. Now, the sunrise, of course, on all of these symbols I brought out is just a smoke screen. Seti and At Atonists do not worship the sun. They know you worship the sun. So they veil what they're into, the private worship. And what we've just been talking about is the private worship. That moment in the desert when they raised the brazen standard, that was a moment of private worship. To stop bickering amongst fallout groups. Many of the, the great world wives probably had agents amongst the people who were leaving, you know, who'd been kicked out during the Exodus. And those women were probably started bickering with one another or bickering with the priests. And so this, the great royal wives said, we want to be represented here. Our agents want to be represented. So the raising of the standard was not just the daughter of Akhenaten making a statement for herself, but probably she was pacifying the other women who were along who were members of the cult. And said, is this going to shut you fuckers up now? Right. You're still in power. Don't worry. But I'm forming a new order. We've left Egypt. And that, when I was in the parameter of Egypt, I couldn't do what I want to do now. But now we're outside Egypt and I have jurisdiction. I am the new head of the Atonists, but I'm also the head of the new great royal wives. And so that's the unique thesis that, you know, constitutes the female Illuminati. And on the website, you know, we expanded on the program and because this thing just goes into unbelievable amount of different symbolism. Remember that the Merovingians are, are their, their first lord. What the fuck is his name? Uh, Merovi is born from a sea serpent. Now, anybody knows that that's nothing to do with real sea serpents, but it's, it's just odd in connecting what we're talking about now of serpents. It really represents that he's descended from the dragon court. His mother is a leader of the dragon court. Whether she's named or not named is immaterial because the Merovige, Merovi and then Childeric and all the other guys, right, who are the famous ones, right, they're all, uh, they're all telling you that the Franks and the Merovingians, they're really, they're real pedigree, symbolically. So you can trace them to the Danites, you can trace them to the Benjamites, and all of that. They they have a different origin in their family tree, symbolically, right, in terms of the serpent race, pre-Adamites. Uh, if you got a tree, you got to have a serpent. That's the way they look at it. you got to have the fruit that's on the tree, and uh, a lot of it is sacrificial. They work in really, really real. If they didn't work in odd ways, then tell me why the Tsar of Russia, emperor of the world, would have been sacrificed. You see, so they have their own. So an official history book may give you an order in which you see somebody like the Tsar at the top, but they have a secret book of another bloodline that doesn't have him quite so high up as the public would think. You see, you got to think in terms of the way they do. It could be actually a, a fairly minor character in the official history book, but they're the ones that really kick ass, like Juan Carlos of Spain, right? Or these Esther Hazes of uh, Hungary, for instance. What a fucking country you're dealing with there. So, you know, uh, so Russia, the royal family up there, they only date from about 200 years ago. You know, when I think it was Prince Michael or the Tsar Michael married a commoner, and all he did was pick the most beautiful chick they could dig up in Russia, married her, and that was the you know the Romanov dynasty. Yeah, but in real, don't you see it in real in real lineage? That might be considered quite low on the grade. There could be other royal fam there could be other royals living in Russia that could say, hey, my family comes from even older than the Romanovs. You see how it works, right? So like that. And you have it too. Look at the fucking look at the fucking state of it now. Harry, what did he marry? Some pole dancer, some strip club bitch? The fuck? That's what I mean. Yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible. Um, Michael, I think we still have a bit of a delay happening. I don't know if you can hear me on time there. I don't know where this... It's a really long delay. It's, it's really almost a like delay. a two-minute delay there. Yeah, okay. But yeah. you can. Are you hearing me right now, though? You're good? It takes a sec? Okay. I'm not sure what that is because your signal's strong, so... We're doing it live here, guys. We'll try to get this fixed up. Um, one suggestion maybe, Michael, would be to uh, just jump out, restart your computer, and then pop back in. Sometimes it's just the machine, um, and sometimes it's the server. I apologize. If you want to take a minute to do that, we'll do a little break here. I'll cover a couple things, and then just jump back on with the same link, and we'll, we'll kick it back in, okay? Okay. Get this fixed. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, 
this is just the way it goes. I've been noticing anybody else that streams with restream. Have you noticed that sometimes there's like issues with certain, um, connections? I don't know. Let me know. I'm trying to find the best software to do streaming with. It's been pretty good so far, but certain guests that I have, it just doesn't work well and who knows why, but the reason this is really important guys to look at, um, just to take it all in. I had somebody asking me what, I don't really know what you're talking about with all these symbols. Symbolism is a lifetime study and you kind of got to acclimatize your vision to notice it and to really understand again, not because symbols are so interpretive, right? This is why a lot of people walk away from it. They're like, ah, oh, it's just a bunch of symbols. But when you study the history of the particular symbol, right? And you get into who used it, what cults, what religions, what sects, what covens, you know, what royal families, what uh, chivalric families, what invest, you know, the, these Amalfis, why they employed those symbols. It's just, it's incredible. It's incredible. Uh, the types of revelations that you're going to have. So um, the symbolic literacy, if you go back to check out, you can get it on Unslaved Premium. You can get, look up Michael's talk from, I'm not sure when he did it, but he did a talk on subversive symbolism in the media. And he does a whole, I guess that's kind of the beginning rollout of how to look at that. And then of course, there's so many people you can read on symbolism. And you should read it from everybody because they do communicate with that as a method. Um, so, and I think Michael's trying to come back in. Michael, if you can hear me for some reason, I don't see your camera. I'll just wait till that's working until I pull you back on. Um, you might just have to select it in your settings. But this is why I thought, okay, if we've got a cult that is actually an ancient serpent cult, Okay, and this isn't just to say serpents are evil. It's just that that's the symbol they use. Look at it in the Bible. Look at all over these ancient texts. The serpents are everywhere. Actually, now that you've seen this, you're going to see serpents everywhere. You're going to go, and these symbols are all over the place. They're all over Hollywood. They show these types of images all throughout their movies and films and commercials you're going to see, advertising you're going to see. It can be variations. Actually, I had something I can show you. Uh, I hope I still have it up here. Where was it? Uh, Skyline Oracle. I wanted to show you guys. Here, I'll just do it again. Um, there are some very interesting Time Magazine covers. I'm going to go genetics. Let's do that. We'll go images. Okay, Michael's back here. Let's pull them in quick, and I'm going to show these images. Hey, there we go. How's that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Apologies, man. I'm not sure why this happens sometimes on oh, there. Sorry. Your signal looks good though. So it might not be that who knows if someone's messing around with us too. You never know, but, uh, we are talking about serpent calls after all, but here we go. Check this out. I wanted to show you this and get your thoughts. Um, this is these time magazine covers for genetics. Okay. And you can go all the way back. Yeah. You know, like look at, I'll bring some of these up a little bit bigger. Yeah. I've used this these is, many yeah. times. Many times, you know, um, just looking even want to know my future, <laughs> you know, uh, obviously this Good one time. is, it's just like right there, you know, the serpent going up the genetic spiral, <laughs> just think about what we were saying with these snake peptides yeah. and it's not just used in the COVID pandemic guys. I think this might be the origin for a lot of these diseases and flus. I think a lot of this so stuff is not what we think. Look at this, the God so gene. Yeah. The God gene. Look right on the forehead. So it's like the Pharaoh. And it's a woman, but it's, it's a woman. A female. There you go. The God gene. You've got. They were in um, charge of it. Yeah. It's like they're unzipping the code with CRISPR. Mm -hmm. Why DNA or why your DNA isn't your destiny, right? You got your gene machine. I'm just going through a few of these. These are just incredible. The IQ gene. Um, <laughs> genetics. Yeah. The future is now especially when we can modify your genetics as we've been doing for centuries. Um, there's just so many good ones. It's just, it's all over the place. Unbelievable. Right? The, right in your face. And the imagery alone is part of the, of the uh, attack upon you. Right. Cause that's communicating mm -hmm. to the, the right brain. 
and the right brain is censored by the left. So, and that censorship has been, if not created by your education, then hugely, right, reinforced by education. And that means even from the parents and the school and everything like that. So they're already playing upon an inherent division. So there's a double entendre. The splitting of your DNA, which is what they're obviously always talking about, is a kind of is splitting. The, the focus is on the splitting, division, scission. Okay, but I'm already a person who's a victim of scission in the fact that I've got two different brains, two different forms of consciousness. One I don't even care to have, even if I could have it, because that's all, you know, quieter and more creative and all that. And there's one that, yeah, gets me where I'm going. So, of course, I sign up for, I've got two tickets I can buy. I always buy the one ticket in which the left brain is in total control. And even though it brings me endless difficulties along the way, well, it's too late. You know, we've turned around the bend and we're off and I'm with everybody else. So, you know, I'm not going to stand in my own way and try to seek for that lost cord or whatever, you know, or this uh, lost. Uh, and why should I anyway? All the millionaires, they're, they're, those are people who are smart, right? All of these medics. All of these doctors that I keep meeting, right? They're all smarter than I am. And none of them are talking about the merits of the right brain or anything like that or deeper consciousness. You know, not, they are now a little bit. And your polyvagal theories are you know, sort of supporting that. But we've had theorists out there from the time of even the discovery of fractals or <clears throat> quantum science that have shown that we need to radically rethink all of that, right? And that's why Abramovich and these people are artists because they are using these uh, hideous satanic in the in the true sense of the word. But look, in my very first presentations on that, I mentioned how and why is it always biblical? Half the ones you showed there have at least some biblical reference to it, Adam and Eve or an apple or whatever. Right. And I think back in, I think it was in one of my the Atlantis original DVD. This is produced in 2003. It didn't get released till about you know, five or six. I have Genentech as one of the, because remember, I told you, I took photographs of all of these companies and had I was using them in my presentations at the time. And I had them down as like fucking, you know, evil as shit from the symbolism. Hmm. From the symbolism. I didn't know damn all, you know, till later about them. But welcome, I did know, uh, because their symbols are on the packets of so many pharmaceuticals that you have in your own, you know, people have in their own uh, houses and stuff. And the black horse was known to me to be a very sinister symbol. In fact, you can almost watch endless amount of James Bonds and those kinds of films, and you'll spot the black horse. Tomb Raider, you get it, you get it in films like Tomb Raider. And you, and once you start getting into the symbol of the black horse, you can't even count how many programs have. It's one of the big ones. It's one of the big ones that opens the door to showing you this can't, cannot be by accident. Somebody in the program, somebody scripted it, some director, producer wants this object to be there on the shelf or in the background. It's so common. It's almost one of the most common. But but Kabbalah comes from Sabel. And Sabel had other names. Uh, Kabbalah, as we've already noticed. Right? Uh, uh, Cable, which is to, uh, to do also with the, with the Kabbalah. And also Cube. So the, the goddess sits on the cubal throne, right? Like you see in the high priestess. That, that could be a word derived from Cable or, or Cubal or Cabel because there's different pronunciations of her name. Sibyl. Remember the Sibylline oracles? It's a corruption of Sibel. That's a Persian goddess. So what this links to is the cult of Mithras we've been talking about. The cult of Mithras in the mode we're talking about isn't male. And when you look, when you looked down with Dr. Artis and you saw Artis and you saw the symbol of the lion-headed god, with the serpent right, with the all serpent. around him? Yep. Yeah, that is just an initiation symbol. I think it's the first. Lion always represents the first degree initiation. And they had seven. So the seven coils of the serpent. Because the serpent is also representing the trials of a mason. And masonry is so indebted to Persianism, we can't even, you know. And they, these are all degraded forms, by the way. Mithras in its inception was something very, very different than Mithras later on. Then you have Zoroastrianism, another corruption. Then you have uh, 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 Saul Invictus, another corruption. You see? So as Christianity moved on, you get corruption as Persian teachings. See, the the Silesian pirates that I spoke of earlier, a secret society that symbol is still on skull and bones, are Persian. They originated with the Persians. 
that's why there's a lot of Persian symbolism still to be found. Fuck the whole nativity story. Then you saw that symbol there. That's just a that's just a, an emblem of you know that there are seven initiation levels. Now, scroll down. Is is there a picture there of Mithras killing the bull? Just have a look on that page. On my page, there is. If you go to that uh, cult of Mithras, you'll see it. Yeah. Uh, killing. Oh, is that it? Wait. Yeah, it's called the Tautoctory. Uh, uh, yeah, that's it. There you go. Yeah, it may not show on this one. Go to my page. Go to the cult of Aton. And, uh, go to Atonism and the cult of Mithras that you used to have before. Not the serpent symbolism button, but oh. yeah, it's on the site. Just go up to the top and scroll down again. Faster scroll. Yeah, just go oh, to the top. Alpha, alpha Romero. Oh, yeah, there is an interesting one. There is <laughs> right a very there. interesting one. Look at that. They have the Knights it's... Templar cross, as well as the downward pointing triangle, which is female, and the dragon giving birth to the initiate. Amazing. Amazing. Meaning I'm okay. born of the goddess. I'm born of her. So go to appendix, the same appendix, number one, and then you'll scroll down and see Cult of Mithras. It's like the fourth one down. What I think. am I doing? Keep going a bit. Under a tree. Nativity. There. Oh, here we go. That's the one. Now, look at the other symbol that's there. It's not just Mithras and the bull. What else do you see? The serpent. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so that serpent, represents yeah. the goddess. <clears throat> oh, okay. That in order order for her acolyte to actually do the job he's set out to do, he is serving the goddess and she's given him a tutelary symbol of power or the secret wisdom that is needed. You know, like Perseus gets his wings, you know, on the feet. Or whatever you know there's a, or a shield or something there's always a symbol that is needed and it's the symbol of the goddess so the serpent is sabelle his mother is there present now that is astrological as well because obviously this, this has to do with the sun entering into taurus <clears throat> right but just like you saw on the mithras page the constellations matter hydra and draco and they're just the heavenly serpents because the whole thing a lot of this mythology comes out of the comet yeah, what did you think about for... the? What did you think about him mentioning? Because he was, an, he just said, "I don't know anything about this." He's, he's, Doctor Artis is in a crash course of occult symbolism now, so he's like, "I just looked up Draco, the constellation, and I found that the stars that they worship in that constellation are like the names of all the COVID variants, like Omicron and all that's these. Right. That's where they're getting it, and of course, it's Greek. Right? They're all from the line. different, yeah." That's right. They're all from the different stars in the constellation of Draco. And Draco is around the pole. So when you see the medical people using the staff and the serpent, oh it's Draco. That's oh where it wow. really comes from. The Caduceus's origin is from that circumpolar region, which was the original Garden of Eden. So it turns mm -hmm. up in the Bible because the original Garden of Eden with the serpent and the tree is the pole access. And it was sacred to uh, two goddesses. Uh, one who was represented by... A serpent you can look her up at buto but she had other names as well b-u-t-o or uh, renat renut uh and vejat there's different names I, I deal with her exclusively in the double volume trees of life book that's why it's called trees of life it's not about trees of life well it is about trees of life but it's also about the heavenly tree of life i had to do two volumes on that to get into this cult so uh the serpent symbol that was raised in the desert is a purely female symbol. And the woman who put it up is not mentioned in the Bible, obviously, nor is the fleeing of the Atonists or the splitting into different tribes. So by the time this group, who were worldwide, she raises the standard because obviously she's announcing herself as the queen of the Egyptians so that she'd also be recognized when they went to Tanis and when they went to Persia and when they went to Babylon, wherever they were going to go on their trips, she would be recognized as a pharaoh. Not just a pharaoh's daughter, but one that is, has been approved by the great royal wives. So you can look it up. Great royal wife. Right on Wikipedia and a story will unfold. But I'm the only one to put the whole thing together. And that's only because the same symbolism was used all over the world. 
Yeah, I'm going to pull that's uh, just as crazy. I'm, I was pulling it up, but I just looked in this Bhutto. I don't know if th this is a, they're talking about a location, but it's obviously named after this goddess. Oh, but, yes. Uh, you have to go. Yeah. yeah. But just it, weird how stuff happens. I'm looking at it. It says the goddess Wajet was that's often represented as a cobra. Yeah, right? that's the one. <laughs> and what's interesting is that one thing Dr. Artis had said was that one of the main venoms used in a lot of pharmaceutical products and drugs and poisons and biological weapons is king cobra venom. It's one of their yeah, favorite and the, ones. And the ureus on the head of the pharaoh is Vedja. And beside it is a vulture goddess, her sister, Nekhbet. So the word Nek, Nek, which means death, comes from her sister. And they were known as the two ladies of the two lands. Their colors were green and blue. Uh, and they were the two twin goddesses that pharaohs wear on their forehead, a vulture, is Nechbet and Vedjat, who is the serpent, Ures, King Cobra. Mm. You see how it works? So yep. the pharaoh is wearing the symbol of two goddesses that without which he couldn't wear that coronet, that corona, without the goddess. So this is the real occult connection to the Mercs. The pharaoh couldn't be pharaoh without the symbol of the two women, of the two lands, they call them. Buto, Renut, a lot of the other goddesses. Uh, even, even Hathor and Isis cannot be understood without Wedjat and Nekbet. I wrote two volumes on them. That's what the Trees of Life book is all about, is these two goddesses. So uh, Isis and Hathor are just a different rendition later by later cults of these two primordial goddesses that started pharaohhood. Right? Their son was a crocodile. Wedjat, uh, or so that was Taur, forgive me, uh, another goddess. But their son, basically boiled down to their son, is the one who then rules the land in their names. And he wore two crowns because Nekbet and Wedjat right, represent the two lands. So even the two crowns that the pharaoh wore were symbols of the goddesses. And umpteen, I've got pictures galore, there's 700 plus color pictures in the two books, <clears throat> leaving you no doubt of this antiquity. And I show multiple other symbols with the goddess holding the caduceus. The goddess holding the caduceus and we do have similar images in the female illuminati program for people to check out so it's a female cult they are the dragon cult they are the dragon cult and that's why when you saw the red-headed model you're sleeping with a serpent and it's in this extremely non-threatening way it's because the serpent is her offspring and everything about the serpent is sacred to her the, the native american indians had it uh, the irish had it <clears throat> because although the Irish didn't have physical snakes, you do you have the symbol of the fucking snake everywhere in Druidism. And that's they were called the Nadreds after the serpent, Adder, uh, Adred, take off the N, and you get Adred, right? Uh, well, that's an Adder. So the, they're mm -hmm. calling themselves Adreds. This is the Celtic Druids, yet they're not meant to have any snakes in Ireland. Well, how the hell do they know about them then? Because obviously it's a heavenly symbol. And so the Egyptians and the Irish are completely connected. You know, Amonists and Druids, more specifically, are connected through the serpent symbolism and the very names that they gave themselves and a bunch of other symbols as well. But those two goddesses are really, really important. Uh, and so you see the connection immediately, right? The goddess is the serpent. The serpent is the goddess. So when the hero is born, it looks like he might be being eaten or swallowed by a serpent. But if you actually study the symbolism, no, he's being given birth. Because once you know that the, the green serpent, like you saw in the Alfa Romeo thing there, is a, is female, she's the serpent queen. She's the serpent goddess. And that means that uh, you've been initiated. You know, like the president of France had a big symbol of those, one of them in his garden. Right? What was his name? So he's just showing oh, you. Yeah. And then it has a crown. It ha the, yeah, the serpent has a crown on his head. Sarkozy or whatever his name was, right? So, so the serpent, if you go to the Alfa Romeo symbol, the serpent, green serpent, has a crown on its head. So that's the holy serpent. There's nothing evil about the serpent. Get that out of your head. And then the other fucking aspect is the flag of the Templars. Well, let's see. Two symbols put together in the company of Alfa Romeo, run by Aurelio Pacchi and the Club of Rome. They're showing you. You know, Fiat and all of these Italian companies, uh, 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 these fucking car companies, they're all controlled by the same Club of Rome people. And in this one, they just couldn't resist. 
telling you, you know, more clearly that it's a secret society symbol. That red cross is Templars. Well, I thought the Templars didn't exist. Yeah, they do exist, but under a different guise. It's the Knights of Malta. It's the clerics. And right. often they can still use the same symbolism. You know, there's a Swiss connection, but the whole of Switzerland is their banking empire. That's all Switzerland is. There's four Switzerlands. The real Swiss, the Swiss Swiss is, is a neutral Masonic bastion. Right? And the top Masonic order there is called the Swiss Alpina Lodge. And that's just the Knights of Malta giving their not only approval, but their financial weight behind any other, you know, little Nazi group that they can form, telling you they're all doing it for brotherhood of man and equity and all this woke stuff that they have going around. Well, this is the uh, flag of my province, Michael, in Canada, British Columbia. Mm, this is yeah. our flag. Of course, British Columbia. You've done Columbia pictures, Kulum, the dove, the Columbia. Yeah. The or, you know, and they've got, look at that, the Templar cross, because that's the Union Jack, right? And then you got yeah. your crown sitting right in the middle. And then you got your sun rays. I mean, that's all Templar atonism right there. And the St. George cross, doesn't he fight a dragon and make the dragon his tutelary symbol, oh, which right. you see on <laughs> other flags? And don't right. you have the Welsh flag that shows you the red dragon? That's only one. In Arthurian legend, there's two dragons, the white and the red, based in you know the idea of uh, King Arthur and the, the joining of two lands. So the, the idea of two lands joining is all a reference to Egypt. I'm sure Ralph Ellis has made that connection. <clears throat> but but the symbolism is key because they use it to this day. It's not made up. I didn't put no fucking comet on no tracing boards to fool the world. And I didn't put no fucking dragons and serpents on the medical profession. Yeah, they, they just... are doing it. Yeah. And then in my shield and... Uh, sword article i made the connection that nobody else has ever shown is the shield itself blue shield green shield you know the shield alone which you find ubiquitously is a chivalric symbol isn't it you know so this is one of my favorites i love yeah, this article yeah, I featured this in the Cult of the Medics. This 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 article, guys. If That's you right. want to learn about the Cult of the Medics, you go read this article. It'll tell you the whole thing. There's some great symbols you show in here. Look at that. There's your. Uh... Oh, could you say a little bit about this me. in in this sign? I conquer this thing. Yeah, that's just again the chivalric knightly idea that uh, <clears throat> let 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 it all be known. And they have the twin swords back there. You see, showing it's two mm -hmm. cults because I call them. Serenatnus. But you could say that's the Knights Templar and the Knights Hospitaller. They start using this after they, you know, remember they have the famous symbol of the two knights riding the whole one horse? Yep. Right. So this dualism, and of course, it's a pyramid seen from above. Yeah. The crown is very, very important because that's Akhenaten. Here you have the double mm -hmm. cross of Lorraine. Double again, cross. showing a collusion between, yeah. And you are being double fucking crossed. <clears throat> now, that is Scottish right. How many churches in America are called Scottish Rite? Yeah. How many churches, uh, how many hospitals are considered Shriners? People got to start looking into this and you'll see the Masonic connections immediately. Yeah, as a badge. There's the, the double cross. Yeah. yeah. And that comes from this province of Lorraine, which is a which is a bastion of the Order of Sion. Remember I said the female, the Order of Sion is female? So right. he's wearing a female symbol. That double cross refers to the province of Lorraine. It's called Alsace Lorraine. And there's the Swiss connection there. And a lot of the secret societies come out of there. People can read can the also, article. I go into great depth. And being that the cross originated from uh, this, the stars and the sky, yeah. you could also look at this cross as, you know, the above and below. And they, of course, see themselves as the masters of both, right? And then yep. you've got, this is the rendition of the two knights on one horse with the two shields, there which make it a double cross. And then there's your Malta cross right there. And this is what, a Templar and, symbolism? Yeah. Yeah, that's the main Knights Templar emblem. And the whores, the horse stands for whores, mm. which is their word for the female group behind them or under them. Whore and horse are puns. <laughs> Exxon with a double like that just says and it's what big oil company it just yeah, tells it just you a, everything 
Yeah, big oil is connected. Remember, because these people have owned the world through gathering the natural resources, which they did at the time of John Dee, was right. a plan was made to gain the natural resources of the earth, earth which is where your multicultural, uh, your multi uh, monopolies, right? Mm. Multi cartels start spreading throughout the world. Now, that's a very interesting date. You see, because before England was starving, right? Remember, I showed the master chronology right. through the purveyance of tobacco, opium, all the rest of it, sugar and caffeine and all of that, they were gaining wealth. And they did it by subduing China, subduing the world. And the dragon symbol is known to the Tongs. It's known to the triads, right? These are all British controlled companies, uh, secret societies out in, uh, they started autonomously enough, but they were immediately seconded into British intelligence who then start taking uh, elite people who spoke the language and they moved in on the Chinese secret societies and made them into the lethal. And those boyos know all about serpent fucking venom, you know, and they were just because the, the, the secret societies of the Templars in my Thule society premium, I go into that, how, uh, uh, the, the masters of Thule, whether it was, uh, you know, von Sabatendorf, but more importantly, people like Karl Hosshofer had come from the East. They were agents. They weren't Germans. They were they were Eastern agents of serpent cults that were now told to liaise with the secret societies of Europe. Now, this had happened in earnest when the uh, the date that to always bear in mind in world conspiracy theory, a lot of them miss it. That's why it's very important. Is what's called Catholic socialism. It starts in 1860. When the first are drawn up but by 1890 the catholic church is now a socialistic organization people forget this date over and over again and i have articles on the female illuminati website on it in eight by 1890 now this is almost 20 years and if you go back to 1860 it's almost uh you know it's over 40 years before the bolshevik revolution when socialism is meant to become the big word isn't it but why would the Catholic Church be signing up documents? I have them linked many times to Catholic socialism up to 40 years prior. Once you date the history of 20th century from this incident, when all the churches turned socialism to socialism, now you can answer a great deal of, as to why Nazis, Stalin, various groups that are just nothing. You just scrape off this veneer and they're socialists. That's why you get Hitler telling you we base our order on the Jesuits. Yeah, because they're socialists long before you even heard the fucking word. That's why, right? They're just branches of this order. They're branches of the Templars who are now well, hiding under a veil of Christian socialism. Sorry, I was just going to say, yeah, they're hiding under that veil. But the, uh, the thing that's interesting is all the images and documentation we have of Vatican agents and priests from those orders, Jesuits going over and liaisoning openly with the with the Nazis, saluting the swastikas, the whole thing. We get in Barrow, Avern, Manhattan, right. and many others. The whole Nazi fool right. dark occult came out of the Vatican. And I've even got that book. Uh, actually, here, I'll show you really quick. It's a short read. It's called, I got this for Christmas. <laughs> the Vatican rat lines. What a great, just interesting veer. The Vatican, the Nazis, and the New World Order. This is an older book too. It's rare, hard to find. Who wrote that? Uh, this is. Uh, that? It's just Maury. Just Maury. He's kind of an anonymous author. Just threw it together. Yeah, you could read it. You but know, you can get. Easy. You can get history of the Jesuits by Edmund Paris. <clears throat> oh, he goes into the Nazi connection. Yeah, the Nazi, all the socialist movement, not just Nazis. That's such a cliche. I don't give a fuck if you're in Portugal. I don't care if you're, you're Fra Franco's France. All the motherfuckers are all Knights of Malta, all Grand Orient Freemasons, and they're all part of the socialistic network. The whole thing we've been handed about Nazis being right wing and all of that is just nonsense. And once you and you'll never make any sense of any you know secret society history in the 20th century as long as you keep on believing. And that's why you have to read, as you said, the Avro Manhattans uh, and your Yuri Linas, uh, people who have the <coughs> a little bit. <coughs> more insight but the thing is that that group of course it dates back to the illuminati in the 17th century they were socialists remember their whole mandate is to get rid of authority get rid of kings get rid of uh 
just like socialists do today. Every trade union worker goes, I, I like that Illuminati. I want rid of the royals. Oh, fuck, I'm for that. So there's not a heartbeat of difference today with a bloody trade union and a key, a card carrying member of the Illuminati. But you have to get rid of that whole nonsense of what fascism really is. Fascism is a bundle of rods. The rods are us, the people getting together as one. Socialism? You cracked it. Once you've got that piece cracked, now a great deal of many doors open in the secret society research. As we know, people listen to this right now are nodding and going, fucking right. It helped me. It helped me. You know, they go, yeah, Michael, you're right, because all these things opened up. I understood all the communist rhetoric of my trade union loving father or whatever it was. You know, 25p, or we're going to bring down the world. 25 cents raise. Come on. I'm going to put fucking white people out of work in Western Europe. You got your you did, you did, got your 25p, maybe, and your 50 cent. Now you don't have a job. It's all immigrants. Was it worth it? You bankrupted your own countries under the name of your fucking trade unions. And the men who tried to warn you about it went missing. You got the mafia to kill them off. Like, you know, Jimmy Hoffa and all that, right? I mean, we're going to get into all that shit. Mafia were used. The, the, the mafia, anyone who's really read on the mafia knows that they're just a side, they're just sidekicks on the street level of the Vatican, or more correctly, the Knights of Malta headquarters down the street. The mafia reported, and that's why the, the Banco del Ambrosio got caught, and you know, Alberto Calvi was found hanging under the bridge. He was given up by the mafia. The fool didn't realize they were Italian right wingers, right? Lucky Jelly. They were trying to rip off their own bank because they were sad about the socialistic takeover of, of Italy. So they made a right-wing move and tried to just embezzle a bunch of money and set up another bank elsewhere. You know who they used as liaison? The New York Mafia. Who answered to your enemy? That's why you guys didn't last wow. more than five fucking minutes. Yeah. The stupid plonkers didn't. They thought the Mafia was a, you know, uh, Mafia would be loyal to them and autonomous and right-wing. No, they've been under the Opus Dei and the New York uh, Archbishopry since the beginning of America, you fools. They're they tell you capitalist. in Godfather 3, Godfather 3, they tell you the whole That's thing about right. the Vatican Mafia. And wouldn't it be accurate to kind of compare what we were saying before about the pirates being sort of the agents of these uh, banking and secret societies as the mafia guys, like those little thugs on the streets, the Sopranos, you know, all your local, they're out there doing but much the, bigger. But, but they're attached to the, to the Sicilian, La Cosa Nostra, the big mafia, the oh. Vatican goes all the way up. I point out that the piratical families who had made so much money not only bought land like Philadelphia and Washington for their coming experiment of the District of Columbia, named after a woman, the dove is just a symbol of the female cult, but they needed to educate their next offspring. So the Ivy League University is not for you. It was originally to educate just like a maritime college. And then the Jesuits had theirs, you know, like Boston College and Georgetown University and Saint, Saint, Santa Clara University. That is one place I used to go around because I told you I lived in the Bay Area and Sunnyvale and Mountain View, and I looked at all the genetic companies and all of the different Silicon Valley companies. But I also noticed the pre presence of the Jesuits. They have one of their major colleges right there in Santa Clara. It's called Santa Clara College. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people you're meeting of a day are educated in that college. That's where you got to watch what you say. So the place is littered with them. And uh, they, they had colleges, all these secret societies, Scottish Rite, opened pharmacies. It's all philanthropic. Of course, there's nothing evil about it. It's just philanthropy. We're helping the little kids, the Shriners, right? With their hospitals everywhere. You don't see the secrets. You think, they think we're making this up, right? They're not even members of the club. They're looking at the thing is costing a billion dollars and somebody's funding it on the shores of America. Who the hell might that be? They're hardly even hiding the, uh, and, and remember I told the list, that I had showed all the directors of everything and how many Knights of Malta there were. I probably still have that document somewhere. It was taken offline. Hmm. But your William Colby's, you see, and your uh, General Haig, you know, and, and thousands of others, all of these people, like these Casper Weinbergers, all the people in government from the, the president changes on the surface, and he, he can be a Mason or he cannot be a Mason. But behind him, his administration is largely Knights of Malta. It's one of the most powerful, it's called the Sovereign Order of the Knights of Malta, S-O-M-O-M. -O -O -M. So look it up. Maybe you'll find a list that does still tell you how. And when you see that, it doesn't matter to you anymore about CFR or trilaterals or, you know, whatever else you may have. Once you understand 
that's this order is the one that's replete and these are the names that you recognize from america history it's all over then you realize the cfr and all of these things they're important but they are just satellites and to give to give people like uh <clears throat> Dr. Coleman is due. You know, he does mention these orders, right? Others won't because, again, remember, you looks like you're coming down on Catholics. And that's the way it's designed. Another writer, like an Anthony Sutton, may be very well-meaning and not want to put off his Catholic readers. So he's not going to really tell you about that. And another guy will, right? Uh, you know, so it's, a, it's, it's a, this is why the research is quite extensive because it's up to you then to find out who's telling the truth. In the Brotherhood of the Bell, they do it very, 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 very cleverly. They do implicate the Catholics, but it's done in a way that's so subtle you would never notice it. At the end of the film, at the Brotherhood of the Bell with Glenn Ford, uh, when they're addressing this pick, the audience at the end just represents all the idiots of America, right? Coming down to the box. You get your little racist guy goes, it's all about white or black, and that's the end of the story. Then they have a Jew baiter bitch comes down, tries to tell you it's all about all the Jews, which is still rampant today all over the web. Well, they do a beautiful job in that film. But if you listen with educated ears, they actually in, they do implicate the Catholic Church. But normally, you know, a lot of them are Catholic. Some of these people who have exposed the Catholic Church, you know, come out of Catholic families. You know, they may have seen the light. So they're really, you know, I can understand why a lot of them would be afraid because they could look at every Catholic person isn't implicated here. I'm not implicating all of the different religious Catholic types. But of course, the moment they hear me talk about those orders, they immediately take offense. So who do I have yeah, to be a fucking? When you're going after Christians and and that in your articles and in when you're talking, you're always keeping your sights on the top of the pyramid here and what they mean by those terms. And the problem is we're lost in language, aren't we? I mean, they they these cats hid behind the veil of being good. They hid behind the medics. They hid behind the religious orders. Uh, many of which, you know, whether people want to take all the beliefs or not, but many maybe had very benign intentions, but then got totally infiltrated, taken over, uh, and then by these orders, right? Who then go, yeah, we're Christians. We're we're here for love and light and all the reasons you fall into these Christian groups or these religious Jewish Islamic groups or whatever, and then they, but they've controlled those strings from the the get go. Uh, there was a, an audio I was listening from you back 2007 or something was just a clip from one of your interviews. And you were mentioning about how there's the surface level or the, the religions of the world are for the marketplace behind the lodge doors. These guys who all wear the costumes, like your popes, just like your politicians, they're all there. Yep. We're here. We're the Shriners. We're the hospitals. We're how, behind the, they're having a laugh because they worship their own secret religions. So they're going to say, "Hey, I'm a, I'm a religious Jew, or I'm a, I'm a religious Catholic, or I'm a, I'm a Baptist, or I'm this, or I'm that, or I'm a New Ager." Huh? But really, they're all controlled, just like even all those cults I was researching, the the California cult, your Heaven's Gate, Jim Jones. There's a CIA intelligence connection to a lot of that as well, which that's your intelligence connection network that feeds in from that. Uh, those elite orders and controls government and, and surveillance. And, but yeah, just a little bit about how what we're talking about here is there's the surface level that most people view and they identify, Oh, I'm going to pick that crowd. I'm going to pick that crowd. I believe in this. That sounds good to me. That's different than what these cats believe. They've hijacked all your religions and all your cults. I I've never met a Christian who knows anything about Christianity. I've never met a Jew who knows anything about Judaism. And that's for a reason. They, they've been given the do documents and the books that they're meant to read or the scriptures, the official scriptures. We're the good guys and those guys over there are evil. Yeah, but if you were sitting at the pew at the other place, they'd be saying the same thing in reverse. Doesn't right. that ever worry you? That worries me that every one of these hundreds of denominations all believe, you know, they've got the, uh, the Karaite Jews. What an amazing group. But they hate official Judaism. They do not acknowledge any priestarchy or any temple of Solomon. But the official Jews think they are her her heretics. When I listen to the Karite Jews, I, I get nothing but respect. I fucking, they're telling you so much truth. And they're totally against any uh, official priestarchy. So the Christian doesn't know where Christianity comes from. And that fucking Pope is dressed from head to toe as a fucking pater nostras of, of, of Mithraic cult. The fish right? hat. 
He's the wearing Druid a gigantic one. Star of David on the mitre. Oh, Why would the Catholic yeah. Church I thought this was a Jewish symbol? Mm. You can find it in Catholicism long before Judaism even started using the Magen David. And the Jews know that. The Jewish scholars, you'll find that. Max de Mont, all the top, top Jewish scholars go, ah, oh, that came around in the 1800s. Yeah, in the Catholic Church, it's been used for de centuries because that's the Illies, the priesthood of the Illies, right? The priesthood, downward pointing triangle, and the Illies of the are the Lord's, the upper trump, the ringing of the bell to get the villagers in line, right? All the rest of it. The whole thing is, is about the people serving these clerics. Right. And so, you, so when Nazism comes along, you know, and the bamboozling of the MI5 authors who controlled the publishers who said, you're right, this shit about Germany, the most benign empire that man has ever known, and Bismarck's Prussia, still to the, this day, the finest welfare state, and a good one, a legitimate one for workers, national workers, not blow-ins, stealing your fucking jobs. All of these wonderful uh, what's movements, truly uh, liberal potentates, Right, even old Archduke, uh, uh, not Ferdinand. He he got killed. At the start off the Second World War. His father's name has just escaped me. Uh, the, the the old Archduke was a benign man who made so many reforms in Austro-Hungary and fuck where they needed it. Russia, the same, a benign monarch. Bismarck, the King of Germany. All of these were benign monarchs who were sweeping. Only probably Catholic France was still living in the Middle Ages, right? Uh, but somebody would say, no, Napoleon. He did his bit as well. So if you add Napoleon in on a good day, then you have and even Catherine the Great, right? So there's various, there's the rise now of benign monarchs and benign despots. Some of them are emperors, the ones I just mentioned. So now you get the First and Second World Wars. Now you get the rise of world socialism. It had, mm -hmm. it came back on the, it came around on the back of benign monarchs who were already doing it. I find that fascinating. But they had to take them I, out. That's what that took was them and replace them. Just like and this is the true story of history. This is the true story of Europe. And, and the main target is Germany, actually. When you get into it, we don't want to get into the whole thing. Germany was the most benign empire ever known. And before the First World War, they hadn't had a war for 40 years. Whereas Britain's history, just think of what it did in South Africa, for Christ's sake. Portugal had a fucking empire that were butchered people over in Thailand. The Dutch had one of the most cruel. The Hungarians are off the charts. Everything that was ever blamed on a German, Hungary did first, and it was their propaganda machine, the propaganda machine of Austro-Hungary to demonize Germany, and the British just pulled up the old propaganda when they needed it. It was invented by Austro-Hungary because they're Catholic and Germany was Protestant. So the real reason, in fact, Germany's the first Protestant country and have been hated by the Vatican and the Knights of Malta for, since, since it began. And, and the Catholic Church have made a separate policy attacking Germany that later, you know, they start doing on America, which is also Protestant. But Germany has been the first target of the Knights of Malta and the, and the Knights Templar because they're the least powerful there. And Austro-Hungary included Italy. But I just don't, I don't even care about Austria or Italy. I care about Hungary. How many people know what a fucking vile place that was? Because it's run and by these people, right? Like they already had control of these lands. And then they just saw, hey, we don't have control of Germany. And it's... I never would technology and industry and everything. So we're, that was what explained the push to attack it. And then the propaganda, I think you have, do you still have that site Germanophobia where you get yeah. into the fact that it became, instead of looking at the fact that Germany got infiltrated and attacked by the Vatican, that's what Nazism was. That's what the whole thing was. That's that, what it was. Uh, they did it specifically to take down something that would compete against their monarchy over the world. It's the same thing they're doing to America, guys, right now. That's what this is. If they were fascists in the way that has been presented to every school kid, why were 70% of the Polish aristocracy completely annihilated and all their treasures taken to Germany? Not only that, but for your people who think that they're up on the Teutonic race, <clears throat> the Poland I'm talking about was for centuries part of the Swedish Empire. So the Poles, especially the aristocracy, were Swedish blood. That's Nordic. Why did the Nazis wipe 70% of them out? Still waiting for the answer. These are blondes, blue eyes in Poland. Yeah, wasn't the it, Nazi thing meant to be to resurrect the old Nordic bloodlines? Well, yeah, if you believe British <laughs> intelligence. The mo there's more Swedish blood Right, Germany doesn't have the Swedish. Uh, Germany didn't have the Nordic blood that Poland had, 
and the Polish know this. If you ask a part, well, you have to work out they're not some ex-communist. But I've talked to the Polish elite. They all know this. German was like the second language. German industry ran the fucking country, but they'd been part of a Swedish empire for centuries. Sweden had an empire. Poland was its key member. And so the white blood and the blue eyes and the blonde hair, just like it is in Finland, it was stronger in Poland than almost any other country. All right. So how does a person who's trying to defend the Nazis, just to say it one more time in case you missed it, go in and kill off 70% or more of the Swedish, uh, sorry, of the Polish aristocracy, this included old women who lived in these beautiful big mansions with treasures galore, treasures unthought of, just like the commies when they ran into St. Petersburg and broke into the rich houses of the rich and smashed willy-nilly the most extraordinary artwork because they're of the people. So we're going to destroy anything an aristocrat has. They tore the jewels from the necks of the women, smashed mirrors that are uncopyable, burned books, libraries, which are unprintable again, and all the other artwork, paintings, you know, uh, tables and chairs of the finest craftsmen that had ever lived was just thrown to the heap by the by these socialists and communists that everybody loves. You think the casualties was only in people? That's bad enough. But there was other casualties all throughout the world. And the Nazis did that identically in Danzig, or sorry, did it all throughout other lands and, and also in Poland. So the story that you've heard about them being all for the white, blue, blonde, you know, blonde, the blonde beast is such a fucking lie. That was a smoke screen, folks, while they killed off the real aristocracy of Europe. And there's quotes from Hitler saying, I think he gets a memo from somebody like uh, Goering. He's saying, uh, just to let you know that the aristocracy of Europe is now a handful. We've we've murdered mm -hmm. them all and we've ransacked their loot. And the only reason they let a few Jews go, it was actually because it was before the war. After 1933, nobody was let out. Right, A few Freuds, a few Zillards, you know, got out. That was only because of the West paying for them to come out, giving a ransom. You know, these are some of the quantum theorists like Werner Heisenberg and people like that. The Nazis let them all out. So if you're a bunch of Jew haters, why are you letting the absolute elite of the Jews have special trains, take all uh, their, their, their carriages there that allow them to take all their family wealth, all out to America, Canada and Sweden and Switzerland and England? I, I don't get it. If you guys are all meant to be Jew haters, why are you letting the elite of the Jewish race leave? And they did that on many. Uh, you can look up on the Germanophobia site. Just go to links and read in horror for a year to, when you find out how you've had on that one, right? But just the simple fact that the Polish aristocracy, they're not just Polish, they have Swedish blood. That means, I mean, Germany's meant to be up there recruiting, you know, stormtroopers for their army from Norwegian and Swedish you know, brig brigades called the Viking Brigade. Yeah. Then what the hell are they doing down in Poland killing off all these other people that are Nordic with Nordic blood? Something's not fitting here. Right. And none right. doesn't fucking fit because you've been lied to. You've been lied to about Portugal. You've been lied to about Spain. You've been lied, uh, lied to about uh, Hungary, as I said. The only way you'll ever find out about Hungary is go to the reports of the German aristocracy. These are people who would have been in the military at that time and working for the king or Bismarck who are in their memoirs. It's in the memoirs of the German elite troops and the generals of the time who thought of Austro-Hungary as an albatross around Germany's neck, which it was, and it dragged them into world war. But when you read those, you don't, yeah, Austria is definitely implicated, but Austria is by no means hated. Catholic as they were, the Germans were, again, they always were, the benign ones, the goodly ones, the ones who were always willing to come to the table, the ones that even in the worst affronts from Austro-Hungary, Germany still supplied goods, trains, and all of the different uh, things that are needed for a culture to thrive. Hungary is the one that's implicated. They're the ones full of homosexuals. They're the ones full of spies, Russian spies. Austria, Austria as well. And it is, therefore, when Russia wanted to come in on the side of Serbia to start the First World War, but Germany warned, and Serbia was almost agreeing, and Austria agreed that out of the 10 points that... Austro-Hungary had to agree to, to prevent the war from taking place. Did you know that nine of them were acceded to? And that the First World War only happened because Russia and Serbia wanted one out of the ten? They wanted all ten? In diplomacy, even eight or seven 
is enough to suspend war forever while further negotiations continue to get that one. Only in one time in history did a country go to war when nine edicts out of ten were awarded to them by the ruling empire, and that's First World War that changed the face of the planet. One tenant, one agreement, which could have just, the Germans were begging them, said, well, oh no, we'll get your one. Stand down, Serbia, because Russia will always come to the aid of Serbia because they're, they're Orthodox church. So the Tsar of Russia, this golden man, this wonderful man, think what you will of him, and believe you me, I have great favor for the Tsar, the last Tsar. But in a flight of religious fucking fervor and some other fucking nonsense to impress fucking nobody Serbia, goes to war. It's not over the killing of Ferdinand. That's part of it. It's to do with these edicts that everyone wants to airbrush and not tell you about. Yeah, this so the first. door, the, yeah. the, the blame of the war is not on Germany as British propaganda fucking told you up, down and gazoo. And Russian propaganda, Russian propaganda was always anti-German. Hungarian propaganda was anti-German. French propaganda was anti-German. And so was British, anti-German. The only people that Germany ever was you know, good with was America. Now, do you know that in the fresh show, in the, this is one more anecdote about this period. But, but what an anecdote it is. Uh, one day before the Franco-Prussian War broke out, this is a big fight between France and Prussia, not Germany, just Prussia. Prussia won. A letter was on Bismarck's desk. He didn't open it because of the war had just been declared. France again, the Catholic country France. We're talking about Vatican control here, right? It was over a trivial matter. It needed not to happen. France also thought they might come out the losers, which they did. You know what that letter was? That letter is the is the world we're looking for. It was a letter from the ambassador of Prussia to, you know, cc to the king of Germany, but it arrived on the desk of uh, Bismarck. It was never opened, and it was the beginning of the negotiations of a triumvirate between Russia, Prussia, or Germany at that time, since the difference was so slight. They were all, there's going to be unification in America. And let me repeat that. Really? A triumvirate, an industrial, mercantile, and political liaison between three of the greatest power companies, countries in the world. The new America that had been built by Germans and Scandinavians. And if anybody doubts that, fucking no way, mate. The railroads and all the work there. The Chinese were involved, of course, but the real workforce was Germanic and Nordic. All the way across North America. Germany, uh, just as about it's going to unify, the most powerful empire in the world, and Russia, who finally had climbed down and realized, because the Tsar had sent ships during the American Revolution, I think it was 12 ships, I have, I know where to find the information, at least 12, and it may have been a lot more, and he sent money and aid to the American freedom fighters against Britain. The Tsar was pro-independence of America, and backed it up by sending troops, ships, guns, monies. Russia loved... America and America loved the Tsar. And the Tsar said, I think, yeah, as, as an act of my, you know, like I said, they're benign despots. One of the greatest acts, he says, I'll even climb down and I'll go with Bismarck's, right, realpolitik, which is, he invented the term, and we'll have a, a triumvirate. The letter was never opened. Bismarck never found out about it because the Prussian fucking French war took place. And that was to disguise any possibility to get Germany to get Germany so tied up in a war, a useless Catholic Protestant war. Again, they wheel it out. Do you know who was the great fucking help in us? As always, stabbed Germany in the back. The House of Hanover, whose leaders sit on the mm -hmm. British crown today. Not the wow. House of Saxony, not Thuringia, not Germany Greater, not Prussia. Hanover. They're Hanover. not German. They're Dutch. They have a Dutch connection. That's how the Dutch connection, you know, the redheads that came over with Queen Elizabeth. That's who they are. Now, about and she comes from. Sorry to pause you. There, sorry to pause you. That she comes from there, right? Queen, the Queen's family, the Saxe Coburg. Yeah, yeah. They're from that. That's them. Yeah, that's Hanover. the German branch. But Hanover is also connected. Yeah, that's right. They're they're Dutch German. Mm. Hundred years before Bismarck ever existed, the House of Hanover was banned from Germany as traitors par excellence. Fucking, uh, you got enemies over there in the Austro-Hungary. No, a province of Germany itself was was banned. And the royals were all, uh, the royals were expelled from the country. 
they went over a great mass of them went over to Brazil and a great deal of them repaired to Catholic France so they're always in with the traders of Germany so the royal family that you have today Windsor are fucking traitors so Absolutely. that's the long story short that's the long story I just wanted to keep short Germany is the is the focus of the of the taking down of the benign despots others were taken down because they're all about to go into liaison with Germany or already were so that was the big and pin so the, to fall that people. opened up the whole period after and that we're still reeling from the ramifications of these events that you're talking about this hidden history and when I said we're going to be doing things that are cut above what we've done before this is just the fucking hors d'oeuvre to where I'm going with this because let me just throw it one more when the might of the Victorian empire descended on the dutch boers where you had the very first concentration camps and children deaths in war as the british troops slaughtered their way through in fact the guerrilla look up the word guerrilla and they will tell you that one of the very first if not the first guerrilla warfare was the boers this is women and children fighting the might of the british empire never had an army been assembled of such proportions in the history of the world germany supported the boers by bringing them through jungles, all the you know different foodstuffs and medicines that they needed. I think it was a uh, General Wagner was his name. Don't quote me on that. At the peril of their own lives, German people opened trade routes secretly underground to bring the Dutch Boers what they need because they're 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 Germanic peoples. All right, Holland, I got a question for you. Then, during the Second World War, when Germany was taken down, you know, with the famous dam busters. The, who let the planes cross? Who let British, French, American, and Polish planes fly across their land to kill off Germany? It's women and children to be starved to death, Holland. Which tells me, Holland, wow. that just a few years before, when your women and children were being butchered and put into concentration camps where they died in fucking misery and in poverty and in disease, Germany came to your aid when nobody else would. The German Empire came there. This is how you pay them back? You scurrilous, dirty, filthy, rotten motherfuckers? You go with Britain? Am I getting this fucking right? We did this in Contradictions of History and the Traitor, one of our first podcasts. You sided like the Irish sided with Britain on Germany, who had never done you any harm and had actually come to save your peoples from totally being annihilated by the Victorians? This is how the fucking world of history, this is how the, the countries pay each other back and then wonder why they've got feuds. And I've just told you, Russia, over one edict, they've tried to say it was about the, the assassination of Ferdinand and that was a bad move. That was terrible. But they're lying. It's not about that. Austro-Hungary did not go to war over that. Russia and Serbia declared war first because they wouldn't get their whole 10 fucking edicts. And Germany was arbitrating and said, look, we'll get it, we'll get it. We'll just come to the negotiation table. Surely, even if five of these edicts were awarded to you, you would stop, you, you know, you, we wouldn't be at the war table anymore. Nine of them is unprecedented. That's how you had the First World War, folks. Russia. Wow. Russia. An orthodox ca a country that's neither Catholic nor Protestant. Factor that in. Religion, and all of this, words. yeah, all of this, what you're saying, when we're talking about these countries, we're talking about the these secret society, religious, Catholic, chivalric orders, infiltrating, taking control, brainwashing the masses, and then cutting it out, cutting everybody behind the knees, behind the scenes, and then they tell their versions of history. And that's why, guys, like, if any of this stuff is like, what, I've never heard that before? Yeah, well, if you think your news is fake today, how bad do you think the history books are? These are scrubbed. The Dutch royal family is the British royal family. So all mm -hmm. those deaths in South Africa, all that poverty and utter suffering, people don't even know what they're talking about. The first concentration camps ever known in the history of the world are British in the Boer countries of the South Africa. The country that comes to save you is your next enemy. And it, eternally, eternally. The Dutch let the planes fly over to bomb the Ruhr Valley, which then swamped the Ruhr and starved the German people, allowing the other bastards to come in. And then, you know, history 
from that moment on. Europe is sculpted out of the, the ruins of the Second World War. So now you want Switzerland and Britain to be the rulers? Yes, you do. Russia turns against Austro-Hungary because on the Tsar's mind, is not Austro-Hungary, it's Russia. Yeah, the, the Orthodox Church hates the Church of Rome. Obviously, they're great enemies. But do you know something? The Protestant Germany was even more a bugbear in the insane mind of the Tsar. It's the German Empire that they tried to scuttle. How many people have ever told you that? And yes, it's right there. It's all documented by the ones who know. Because the fight, and let's just call it a propaganda fight, although it was also an open fight, the propaganda wars of all these different nations against Germany is the story of our world. Now, even though uh, the Tsarina, Alexandra, was a German, the people of Russia hated her. They used to call her that German, the German bitch, the Tsar's wife. You know, he made a mistake of marrying her. And the country never forgave him. He married her to try and, you know, create some sort of liaison, but it never worked. The masses of the Russian people and the Duma, the government there, hated Germany, hated it being on its southern shore. Just as much as many Germans hated it being on the northern shore, because that blocks trade routes. And you've got to watch what Russia was doing way over in the Middle East. This brings in the Ottoman Empire, I don't want to go into it. But Russia and Armenia were allies against the Turks. And that is because the only trade route left to Russia was the Caspian Sea. It was, what, it was the Crimean War and all of this was fought over this. So the Ottoman Turks and the Arabs were anti-Russian because they knew that the Russian presence is there using Armenian spies. So when you hear about the Armenian genocide, this also plays into the very story oh, I'm talking okay. about. And much more so this... does as well, the coming together of Israel and things like that. Hmm. But what you don't know, and here's another fascinating part of this. Although the Arabs and the Turks were anti-Russian, the communists of the world, the socialists of the world, this will later tie into what's known as Islamo-communism, which we're still going to be dealing with in the future, by the way. Nobody wants to mention that. We've had our guests on, like Chuck Morrison, all who know all about this, and, and others. Trevor Loudon, for instance. <clears throat> now, socialism got into Islam. Look Just up like it got into Catholic, the, the Christians. That's right. That's right. Afterwards now. Afterwards. Communism, socialism, not just socialism, but hardcore communism. Gets, look up pan-Turkic movement, pan-Arabic movement. They were aligned with Russia. Three to five of the Turkic leaders, these are the great Masonic leaders. We had Diana Springola on. People should go back and watch that. She wasn't in good health, but listen to that podcast in which she tells us and confirms that the Turkic leaders, who are all Jewish, by the way, meaning Sabbatean, they came out of Salonika, after they were defeated, ran straight into the arms of the communists. They move from Turkey and they go to be harbored by the communists. Because they did that because the Turkic movement there also had communists within it that brought down the Austro-Hungarian, the Ottoman Empire. So I've just pointed okay. out, Russian Empire falls, Look what we're talking about. The Tsar brings Russia down. The German Empire is in ruins. Bismarck's policies don't work. Austro-Hungary, a gigantic empire that includes Italy and many other places or throughout the world, collapses, and the Ottoman Empire collapsed. Accident. Of course, of course. How did I not know wow. that? Wow, yeah, to There's zoom four out. Four or five empires. What's happening at the same time? America is rising. America was about to enter into a liaison that would have seen it right for, you know, because after the travesties of the War of Independence and the Civil War, America needed some good luck. It had so much internecine fighting because the Catholics are over there in the form of the South, the man who shot down Abraham Lincoln. The South is in with the Jesuits. They're trying to bring popular, wealthy, progressive America down. Get it? The bankers were all sent from France, Belmont, Rothschild, etc. They, they commissioned the assassination of Lincoln, not just him. America was going to align itself with North America. That is the world we're all looking for. So under Trump and under all, you know, everything that's happened in the last 200 years, that is the missing piece that nobody wants to talk about. The liaison between Prussia or Germany, Russia with, a, with an American loving czar, looking at it as a progressive place. Remember I said on another podcast that the czar had gazillions of dollars and maybe 50 banks throughout the world. He had invested his own personal finances in America, in banks there. He was a really? supporter of the banking system of, of, of America. 
That meant that he was egging on his own people, these aristocrats, to invest heavily in America. The Tsar of Russia, investing so heavily in America that America would have been solvent, mate. Economically, wouldn't have had to rely on Britain, wouldn't have needed to enter any into First and Second World Wars in order to appease the British to get some air bases and to get some, you know, economy. This is Churchill's deal. Churchill, the filthy maggot of history, loved America too, but in a different way. His, his mother was American, and he went over there to seduce Bernard Baruch and Felix Frankfurter, you know, in order to get mercantile, because Britain was sinking. Britain is a third world, not fucking the, the German Empire that got scuttled. Even Russia finally says, the greatest enemy Germany ever had, says, finally, we will now go into a liaison with our old enemy, Russia, because it's uh, uh, Germany, because it's worth it. And we've got a fairly good man in, in power there. And they're about to unify and things will be good. We can't afford not to unify with them. So this triumvirate, folks, is the missing piece. You know, and what I've told you is just a little bit of an anecdote here. But it is another cast of criminals. Because once you look into this, then you find Hungary, Austro, Austria. Yeah, fucking cast your eyes down, you bastards. And Italy and other places too, but primarily Britain and the dirty black nobility rats who are serving our queen, right? All the governors, Earl Grey and all of these different uh, politicians that you know, say from Gladstone's period, are serving the black nobility. The black nobility have arrived in the form of William the Orange. And William of Orange is the man who put the entire country under debt of war. The first fucking Dutchman who gets there, the first fucking Hanover, and they're all French Catholics from, you know, the Merovingian dynasty. The only in fucking country, five minutes, and he's borrowing from the Amsterdam bankers to lay the entire of England to war that they've still never paid off. Uh, one scholar who's a great historian says that we still haven't paid, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the war that uh, William got into with the, the Catholic Stuart dynasty is still not paid off in terms of the debt. The, oh, to this day. So what happened was, to this day, that's how the Bank of England, which oppresses the country, it was opened as a garner of the debt of King William III because they all sat around and went, well, you don't have any money, but the people do. So just like William the Conqueror had you know, put the Doomsday Book in to tax every chicken, so William III, just as we got out from under William the Conqueror, now this other bastard comes from Holland, black nobility, pure and simple, that's what they are. They even call themselves the black nobility. I'm not making this up. They are calling themselves that because their deeds were so black. They're called the Black Gelfs. Look it up. G-U-E-L-P-H. It's one of the names they don't want you to know that the Queen of England comes from the Black Gelfs. They point to all the other ones instead. Now, these Black Gelfs are notorious, and they were fucking thrown out of Germany as traitors. Then they go in line with the bloody Catholics, and now they're sitting on the throne claiming the act of succession. We can only be Protestants. What a lot of nonsense. The red phone is to the Vatican. Edward VII, the glutton, was the first British monarch to go visit the Pope. It's all over from that moment on, mate. And you know Edward VIII, the one who abducted, uh, abdicated? He is a Vatican lover. He was a he went to see the Pope with his Mrs. Simpson. Mm. Protestant, my ass. Act of succession, my ass. You got to see through all of this shit. The kings of England were, were Pope lovers. Oh, yeah. Well, of course. Look at this. this the Queen is of just England. Right is... on, yeah, just right on uh, Wikipedia here. White and black gelfs. The black continued to support the papacy while the whites were supposed were opposed to papal influence specifically the influence of pope boniface and pope boniface he's that's unum sanctum right there that guy dante was among the supporters yeah. of the white gelfs and no, in right. 1302 exile when the black gelfs took control of florence wow they're the support. black nobility that's the black it. venetians the uh, venetians. dr coleman and West Webster Tarpley call them the Black Venetians. You can read all about it. I've been putting it into my work since the Origins and Oracles. Now, this group is the most perfidious, and they are the elite. And there's your connection to the Catholic Church. They've always been secret Catholics, which connects them to the Knights of Malta. Now, back full circle. In, in England, the Knights of Malta are called the Order, the Venerable Order of St. John of Jerusalem. Right. You showed a picture of them earlier with a black robe and the Pate Cross, right? Yep. So the Knights of Malta or the Knights Templar operate in England under a Protestant guise called the Venerable Order of St. John of Jerusalem. It's all on the female Illuminati website. The Queen of England is its supreme head. She's the distant cousin of the leader of the Knights of Malta, Andrew Bertie, who heads the real Knights of Malta in Vatican. They're not Catholic, by the way. So the Queen of England 
heads the Knights of Malta in England, and her cousin is just happens to be of the same bloodline, and you know that their bloodlines are quite extensive. Just happens to be the he, the head man, the leader, the lead prior of the Knights of Malta. What a fucking coincidence! They bank you... in Lyon, London. You've been to the London Centre where they bank. Oh, it's insane there. The symbolism all over the Bank of England now. That the that Bank of Switzerland. Yeah, Brussels. It's Templar dragons. Yeah, right Brussels, down there. Right, they're all over. Yeah. They're in America. Yeah, yeah. So when that letter didn't get read. And the Catholics were able to then breathe a sigh of relief and come into America through Georgetown and Boston College. And now they're everywhere. The diocese of uh, New York City and Philadelphia, it's all, all Catholic. They could breathe. The, the, the damage was done. The czar gets killed. How can you have a triumvirate with a guy who's not there anymore? All of these empires fell. They knew the Russian, they knew America's empire was going to rise, but it had to be scuttled from the start. I'm not indicting every Catholic any more than Malachi Martin was. He is one of them who turned coat. Father Rivera, Alberta, Rivera, Father Chinaque, on and on it goes. We've got yeah. the list, Edmund Paris, right? You can be inside. What I want you to do is do in Avro Manhattan. Be from the inside of these secret societies and blow the fucking whistle for the sake of humanity. Don't let these demagogues rule. Because they're not of you. They wave the British flag or whatever, but they know what it really means. They know why they got those dragons at the city of London. They know why the symbols in Pall Mall and all the other places I studied. Now, I couldn't study that symbolism in America the same way because it's not the same, is it? But I did the next best thing, which is continue studying symbolism. But this time it was in the Silicon Valley, Sunnyvale and Mountain View and Palo Alto. And I learned just as much from studying that as I ever did from studying, you know, a uh, 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 the stuff I would have done in the streets of London or Belfast, right? And but, but while I was studying that, I was wondering, why does Taco Bell look like a church? Why does Jack in a Box? Remember we said Cube? Mm. I'll tell you something funny. Cube is probably Sabelle. Let's take a, 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 a take on her name. You know, Cubell or whatever. Cube is sitting where? Where's the black cube of the goddess? sitting in Mecca. Mecca, Mecca. It's all female mm -hmm. symbolism. But did you know that the Holy of Holies within the Temple of Solomon is a cube shape? There's another cube. Right. Did you know that the thing worshipped in a Masonic lodge is called a double ashlar or double cube? <coughs> right? Because although it looks rectangular, the Temple of Solomon, when you actually go into the part that's actually the Holy of Holies, and it was all this orgiastic symbolism around. The, the banner that, the, there was a large um, banner with a five-pointed star on it that the priest had to go through. Five-pointed star is always female symbolism, sex sex magic. So the drape, the drape was a gigantic five-pointed star, but the curtains on either side were all filled with Karma Sutra, you know, orgiastic sex symbols. And this is whistleblown by Jewish scholars. I'm not making this up. <laughs> and then when you went actually into the inner sanctum called the Holy of Sophol, it's a cube, folks. So it's Sabel symbolism all the way up and down. And uh, her name can also mean twisted cable. We get cable. So a lot of candelabras, you know, are, are twisted like that and stuff. So the, the Sibylline. So every time when Dr. Artis, uh, Artis was told by his colleague that it was Mithraic symbolism, we know it's female symbolism because Mithras, like Attis, like Tammuz, like Horus, are only sons of the serpent, queen. So I'm glad we got a chance to talk about this, uh, to bring that out. It's female That's symbolism incredible. should always be borne in mind. It's just stunning. And I'm just going, I'm showing people on screen some of these symbols. It's just amazing. And um, like we've got, there's so many podcasts packed into this one show. I hope everybody's taking some notes. If we list, pivot back to this whole Corona thing and the symbolism there, you were talking about uh, the Vatican influence. I think that that's the cult that Marchetti was talking about when he was saying that the CIA had been taken over by a secret cult. There's your Jesuit guy. There's your Malta guys, right? I mean, Mussolini, uh, yeah, Mussolini was, <clears throat> a, was a knight of Malta. The list of the people, the Rothschild, the top Rothschilds yep. were all night. So what top. are the top? Everybody's like, oh, the Rothschilds run the world. Really? <laughs> so you think so? Uh, they go no, get they on don't. their knees. They go get on their knees and swear oaths to the Knights of Malta and the Vatican, okay? 
and they're not as they're not as they're, Jewish they're Sabbateans. as you think. Exactly, exactly. They're not Jewish at all. Just in the right. same way that this fucking cult has got behind the Pope and all the other motherfuckers and the bishops. That's why they're all silent. Judaism has fell. Judaism. Look, Judaism is probably a simple takeover because the, the they were highly literate, but they they have their own peccadillos. And they have their own occult level, by the way. Judaism has its own occult level, just in the same way that Christianity does. But in any case, look up they Sabbateans. They got infiltrated. Yeah. They got infiltrated. And that's the way it is today. So when you see the different uh, Rothschild connections to these Knights of Malta, to the medical profession, Genentech was started by one, wasn't it? Cohen or whatever his name fucking was, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So when, when you see those kind of people, stop thinking Jewish. It's not going to work. You're just making idiots of yourselves. I know it sounds all wonderful, but that's novice stuff. There's more Gentiles control this fucking world than Jews do. That's a fact. And they're behind the big crime. They may have used other people because they've infiltrated you. And for some reason, Jews and socialism go together. It's not a good combination, but there's a lot of Jews that are not the socialists and who love the West. You can't be blaming all Jews. There's a lot of Gentiles are in the fucking socialism. So come on, you know, that's another one we're going to do. And I've got part one ready to go. Of my history of the Jews, and you gonna fucking see where that leads. That's just part one. Well, really, the Khazars is part one, the one we already did. Mm. But I've gone specifically into modern Jews and their history uh, after a lifetime of research. So when you look at that article, uh, the serpent symbolism, just remind myself there, links are below so you can follow things up to qualify everything I'm saying. All of the study of the serpent, and uh, what they leave out, I've put in that it's primarily a female cult. Uh, acolytes are those who are initiated into, you know, that the goddess offers up family bloodlines. And that motherfucker in Italy had it. Oh, I'm one of them. I'm going to show you. Look at my coat of arms or these Alfa Romeo mm -hmm. heads, you know, who are all Club of Rome. They actually sometimes want to show you that, they, you know, but they'll do it symbolically because they know that then 95% of the population, even in Italy, don't have a faintest idea that one of the most elite families of the black nobility is called Columba. There's your Columbia. You know? and the, yeah. They're, they're fucking all there, but you got to put it together. The white gals and the black gals. Dante was one. Dante Alighieri was one of the most enlightened men we've ever known. The fact that he was on the side of the white gals should show you everything, because he knew his fucking enemy was, right? And so these Florentines and these Venetians, they had the spice trades. They're really worshippers of Venus. Remember, Venice is Venus. Phoenician right. is Phoenician. Phoenician is, is Venetian. It all comes from the worship of the goddess. And you can prove this. It's a long, you know, through the symbolism, through the alignments of different other great stately homes, various other, you know, you got to be able to see through the veil. That's what my work is always dedicated to is look to the female power behind the throne, even in America, these Eleanor Roosevelt's and now you got loads of them, right? I mean, come on. Right. But they also use the lower acolytes <clears throat> and uh, they'll pick from whatever seminaries and schools and colleges. They pick from Jews in the past because Jews happen to be intelligent and well-read. And are very liable and loyal and things like that. But they pick from other groups because they're warlike and bloody and bloodthirsty and whatever. And as we saw in that one uh, feminization of America, where we dealt with a Kevin McDonald thesis, America's finished from way back. But I just wanted to start there with that whole thing of the you know the post czar triumvirate, which could have changed America. America would have been solvent because the czar would have made it solvent. All his people, all all the people who love Russia. And love the czar would have been investing in America. America would have never looked back over its shoulder. And it certainly wouldn't have been looking at filthy England, which was its enemy, if you remember the little small thing called the War of Independence, as much as it was the enemy of Russia or everywhere else. Well, and all of this. So never saying, forget the Catholic Protestant thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that the the war behind the throne, right? The 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 chess players, they're playing on the big game of chess. It goes yeah. way back. Um, and that all the things that you're mentioning actually can give us a ray of hope because if we learn these things and understand how this predator works, how they work, how they've taken over, then anything can be reversed. Every, every problem that's been created can be solved when you know how the problem was created. These liaisons can, could be resurrected again if we, if, if we get the right people in and we can expose these evil ones and, and route them out of our countries. I mean, that's what we're all trying to do. But real quick, Michael, um, to pivot back to the Corona thing, I don't know if you saw that bit in my artist interview where we were talking about <laughs> the foundation of the intelligence spy network, okay? The way they did spy and surveillance. And don't forget, just symbolically, um, 
the whole process throughout this whole pandemic of we've got to track and trace everybody. You got to download all these apps. You got to tell us where you're going, who you've been hanging out with. Uh, you got to report your neighbors if they're having barbecues to too many people. Um, there was this whole thing about almost like creating the Stasi thing again in the public. Mm -hmm. But that was to get us a part of the ritual of the gig of they are the ones that are obsessed with surveilling every detail of your life. And is it any coincidence that the name of one of the major programs that was launched for surveillance in America to surveil the world? <laughs> Look what it's called. Yeah. The Corona program. Yeah. And just you know, they, they write these little books. Ooh, the Corona star catchers. Stars. Like it's all over. You just get... <laughs> I haven't even seen this, but look at the way they're all sitting. <laughs> it's yeah. a triangle. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. They love their symbolism. You'll find oh, many man. a cover of a magazine with Mason standing in a, in a triangle or sitting at a... You've seen that one where all the presidents are sitting at a table and there's a giant eye, all seeing eye in the middle of yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Clint, Clinton and others, or the Bohemian Grove connection, which is yeah. an owl is Minerva. Right. Owl oh, is right. Athena. Yeah, Athena. Yeah. It's a female symbol. The Bohemian Grove are a clutch of elites who serve the, the female Illuminati. They don't even hide it. Because Minerva, right, the owl goddess, was Sulis in England and Anat in Babylon. She's also known as Neith in Egypt. And she's known as Athena in Greece. But Athena came from the Egyptian Neith, who comes from the Babylonian Oh, excuse me, the Canaanite Anat, A-N-A-T, sometimes with an H. And even the goddess Tanith, T-A-N-I-T, is somewhat related, like a Babylonian version. So it's not Astarte. It's not, uh, that's a different goddess, right? Anat. And Anat held a bow and arrow, which became the Rothschild symbol. Neith is in a red dress holding a bow and arrow. The Rothschild, the red shield. Mm. Neith holds the red shield and dresses in red, the Egyptian goddess. They are not Jews. I'll make a fucking pig's ear out of you if you want to pull that one. That's dead. That's pantomime, you fucking twats in this fucking movement. You can't see the fucking trees for the wood, right? I mean, it's just ridiculous. This is all Egyptian symbolism. I proved it a million times over. And Athena in, in Rome, is it in Rome or is it in Athens? In Athens is the statue to the, there she is. In Athens, uh, a statue built out of war leftovers or whatever you want to call it is was the goddess Athena. Tank, you know, all these fucking chariots and swords, right? The original statue to Athena was built out of weapons. This monster really? of a thing to the goddess of blood. All right. I, wow. I did a premium called Goddesses of Blood. I suggest people watch it. Might open up a few ideas about the kind of women that are ruling the world still. And just a question it's on that, Michael. So to, to take it back, to kind of go full circle a bit, um, we did a show on Unslave recently talking about the cult of the medics, but we went way into, we actually looked at it through the lens of your Atlantis book, which was so fascinating to me. When you bring in this um, female Illuminati, these site, these the, the history of these goddess traditions, the cults, why they're, the female, the whole thing. You talked about this a while back. Um, if we brought in the alien connection and the ancient visitation, genetic manipulation, where the medics were born, the whole thing about the bloodlines and the, the obsession with genetics. If we bring in the, that component, um, is what's the reason why it started with females specifically with, is it because of the liaison with the Nephilim and these particular cults or yeah. what was the, and that's, they're the offspring. That's why they have more of that alien DNA. Is that why that no, is? No, they, they have the same DNA, but they were chosen. And the only thing I did is take Genesis six and turn it around. The women wanted to be part of them. There was no fighting. It's one big missing piece in Genesis. The war that should have fought when the men came to the rescue of the women. I don't want to be Spielberg about this, but there's a missing part of your movie, mate. I'll tell you the why there's a fucking Enoch, missing part. It? Yeah. I'll tell you why there's a missing fucking part. It's because the women went willingly and the men didn't bother chasing after them. And then the women turned around and wiped out the whole of mankind. It's in the Bible. It's in the book of, like you say, women did an atrocity on this planet to wipe out the males. That's why they needed to genetically modify other people, you know, a hybrid race. Fuck knows where they came from, right? But they're, they're part alien DNA. 
and part human. Let's just agree on that. You know, since we're shy on evidence. But the women then became the queens of the world. It's all at the end of the priesthood of the Elys, the one I did, that we did. The longer These one. women, this this group, this yeah. this is the group that was targeted. Because you also had mentioned, I think you said there was a group, were they called the Sophix or something? They were the competing group. And they must have got wiped out as well from these these witch covens. Yeah, that, that's in the female Illuminati. Right, okay. Because obviously all women are not evil. Right, and uh, there was women on the side of the Adam of the uh, of the Atlant uh, uh, of the. See, once the Adamic race was created, they were all created with the alien blood. There's no going back. But there was women on both sides. There was women who wanted to serve the light and the truth, and that's where your Blavatskys come from, who were the ones who were pointing out the real devils, and then always advocating we need to use the same we need to use the same spiritual rites and rituals let's just call it that our enemy does otherwise you can't win and they're quite right i agree with them so then these female mendicants because the evil ones that i mentioned in the great royal wives and then what followed with the atonist queen obviously there's women of great power who did not subscribe to that and they 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 existed up until they could so that's the I, and just for convenience i call them sophianic because it rhymes with satanic and sophic because it means wisdom now, there's no doubt right. that those women also lived. That's part of the story. But the thing is that uh, we always know that the evil ones, because they got no conscience, will always win the day. Up until the point, you know, where you have, like Blavatsky and others warned. And who does she implicate? Number one, it's in volume three, so it's hard to find, the Catholic Church. Who did mm. Freud in implicate in the introduction to Moses and monotheism? The Catholic Church. And on and on it goes. Because they've been around, no matter what their atrocities have been through the decades and the centuries, they're still there, aren't they? That, tough, that takes some power. And that's not just an ordinary power. That's magical power. Because they've got it and you don't. The hex is the is the Star of David. The hex, putting the hex on you. They know what it is. The hex is gods and servants. We're their servants. And we are their loyal fucking servants. And they use media. Medics and media is connected for a reason. It's right? like the same, so, yeah. So they'll lose, but only when we understand how their black wings have enveloped the earth, which is what your Professor Tolkien's and Professor Lewis's and many others could mention, tried to get us to do. Maybe they only had a couple of things they could open the drawer upon to let us know, right? But Huxley did. So, you know, Orwell, there's a host of people who said, I can't tell you all about it, but I can tell you a couple of key points that if you knew how to run with this, you know, and of course, symbolism is a very key part of it. Etymology is a key part of it. Then again, why is the symbol of the serpent connected to the gene? They're euphemisms. The DNA spiral and the serpent are been put together artistically, and nobody but us have ever questioned why that is. They just accept it. That goes to the right brain. That affects the old limbic genetic reptilian brain, which knows the answer, which has the answer. So when they're putting snake venom into you, and that's how I knew that it was a toxin in myself, I vaguely knew, didn't know until I watched the interview, but I was dreaming about snakes. From the very first day I ever got symptoms, I was dreaming about fucking snakes, and I never dream about snakes, especially in a sort of a you know, slightly nightmarish, not, nothing that horrible. But you know, where does where mm. does horror begin and end when you're dreaming about snakes? It's all pretty horrible. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I mean, that is unreal, right? I must tell you. So that's your unconscious trying to tell you that you just been infected with some fucking snake venom, mate. How do you feel about that? And your subconscious, you know, whatever the remarkable process that is. And so although I know all the different critiques about the unconscious and how it could be this and how it could be that, I still have to give it its due because there's a thing called Freudian slips, isn't there, where a dishonest man makes a Freudian slip and the truth comes out? Well, back up and tell me what that tells you about your unconscious then. Well, and the a, connection to the body, the, sub, the somatic uh, same thing, thing. is telling you. It's the same it's, thing. It's, yeah. it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you can't write the unconscious off as just this. And I, I love the scholars who come up with a cogent theory about it. But wait a minute. You've seen these people in lockup when they're being interviewed by the police. No, they are lying away, but their body language is all telling them the opposite or their mm -hmm. eye movements or whatever. Right. That's the unconscious. So, hey, let's take off our hats for a minute and say, wait a minute, there's more to the unconscious than the average reductionist, you know. And I do. I point out their case, but I also point out. You know, hey, 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 don't just lock it all down. You'll see it in your own self where you make a Freudian slip and for good reason, you know, because you're fucking deceiving yourself or you're trying to deceive somebody else. And, you know, then that's a good thing. That means that there's a justice. There's a feeling there's a diff deeper conscience within us. Glad to know it. 
not so eager to wipe out the unconscious now it's a materialistic reductionist uh, you know model am i something deeper going on there okay right so in the same way we will always defeat evil once we understand its ways that it works on us subliminally through these logos and symbols and through the etymology i was i i uh met one guy who was one of these illuminati guys who designed these logos and he told me i told i thought i was dreaming and he told me oh we we copyright thousands and thousands of latin and greek names and i didn't have the heart to tell him yeah and also from the occult world right that would have shown him who i was mm. i always talk to these people as if i'm a complete imbecile that's how i get the information i know you know uh, but he basically said yes because of course because the the symbols are uh, the the names he was talking about are not all greek and latin right next star and all of this shit it is occult you don't have to ask the bastards it is fucking half the stuff that they're talking about pentium and all of these terms they're occult they come from the cult world i don't yeah. need i know i didn't need the zaro mark on my forehead to go oh I believe it now like some other dumb asses you're running into the fucking symbols are everywhere the symbols of the owl the symbols of this and that and the other the shield everyone yeah, thinks that's, that's chivalric because yeah, it yeah. looks male right it looks like a oh, fucking shield shield means what outside the normal phraseology well hiding something maybe I like a shield hiding behind a Three shield. fucking cheers right. yeah he gets the nobel prize brilliant you're a fucking genius that's right so your emblems of your countries are shields dickheads what's behind it an eagle do you know where that comes from or a vulture more like used to be a phoenix start looking into it e plubis unum that this was used by atmos from time immemorial and all the stuff i've done on the cult history of america that premium there which i feature the work of nicholas hagar and he's the one who has all the facts on the czar now i remember he has the facts on the whole czar support of, of america hagar. yeah nicholas hagar it's right there on the same site you were looking at oh and is this is this then you were doing the history of the the three nexus and then how they took russia and the whole thing That's right is this why russia adopted the double-headed eagle symbol was from i don't that know period, or i don't something. like it because it's yeah, it's that's totally me, templar russia's and, fucked is what yeah. that is that's a black nobility symbol black nobility right. no that means and also they took red white and blue that's worrisome enough oh, red right. white and fucking blue the masonic colors yeah no there, there was anti-masonic right. society in america Half the, you know there's people out there written on this like your victor marchetti's and your Avro Manhattan, of course, he would be at the top level because he was a top level insider who was wined and dined. He was top table. And nobody he knew what he was the Knights. He sat with the Knights of Malta, didn't he? He was and one. He was a member it. of the Knights Templar. And he right. was, uh, yeah, and he had contacts from within who were whistleblowing the shit. And he mentions this in one of his books. He doesn't mention the sources, but he says the sources in the British Foreign, foreign Office. Now, the Foreign Office is controlled by the Rome. Or well, we know who when we when we say Rome, we know who we really mean. The Knights Templar. And Navar Manhattan was a dissenter who didn't want these orders to, you know, undermine the sovereignty of countries. And he became the expert in it. So his books are really hard to find, you know. But he was the one who said that uh, it was it was uh, Roosevelt who was the very first president to have a direct line to the Pope. And the second one was Richard Nixon. So if anybody out there has been wondering about oh good old Nick and how good he was and maybe Watergate was a farce and blah 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 now this guy was already selling you your country out he was a Vatican agent there you oh, hello <laughs> yeah wonder what that could mean that's my that's one of my Bibles I've read all his books Vatican Holocaust yeah another one unbelievable he see when he wrote these books right he was in consultation with Serbian prime ministers serbian generals all you know because serbia is the great enemy of the vatican people didn't know that uh, japan as well by the way might explain the three betrayals of america to, J to japan since before the first world war like why they were involved in those wars against the west a little bit of a story i don't know people might want to know about that but anyway he explains that see the jesuits had been expelled from 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 japan in the 16th century to a man and never allowed back in ever their number one list of the hatred of the jesuits is japan their religion wow. and, and their ways yeah but they got into china which is exposed in shogun you know that 
film oh, Shogun yeah. and other books. Yeah. And, yeah. and the greatest writer on that is actually, the, if anybody's interested in that Japanese number, they should read, because I want to mention up-to-date books, read Pat Buchanan, Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War. He has chapters on it. It's actually a fascinating book anyway. It's on my highly recommended list. Hit, uh, Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War by Pat Buchanan. All his books are masterly. He's a great, great guy. And, uh, you know, very pro-Trump and all the rest of it. So, uh, you know, uh, a good patriot, I would say. Uh, so never yeah, indict all Catholics. Never indict all Knights of Malta. Never indict all CFR. That's going too far, right? You have to have whistleblowers from within. Are you gonna? Are you gonna? Are you gonna whistle? Are you gonna condemn Anthony Sutton and Geodra Griffin for being Christians or some stupid shit or some guy for being a Jew? See, if that's the level you're on, to Sarin and unslave, mate, you're in the wrong fucking place. I'll kick your fucking ass. Out you go. Out, out, out. Right, and. I still read the books of people who are right on the wrong side there because I value a Eurelina or I value, a, you know, because it's all about getting all the pieces together so that you can make an informed study. Right. But I just prefer coming at it from a very unbiased level because it'll help you because it isn't Jews are not in control of the world. That is a lie. Just keep writing that out a hundred times. That is a lie. And it's concocted by the black nobility who definitely have used Jews because they've got their own people in Judaism that work reversely. But once you put the, you know, the, the, or, or the protocols and you find out who, who Karl Marx was and you find out his hatred of Jews and you find out the alternative story, which you people don't bother looking into, well, you'll find out one day that you've made a sheeple of yourself and that you've just listened to a lot of agent provocateurs. And it's the same thing unless you've picked up Kevin McDonald. See, I specialize in all of the, little, you know, the, the volumes and the works that are out there that contain the stuff you don't want to know about. Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Amish. Yeah, those bloody story. pilgrim fathers. Yeah, fuck that. Oh, what the fuck? You're talking it's to me about Jews, mate? No chance. What about those lovely egalitarian, ecumenical, multicultural Puritan fathers and their antics and what they used to get up to? Or they're so, the socialists, they were all socialists. Like there's Robert Owen and many others that came to Virginia. We've had guest after guest after guest on going over that period and showing what rotten little fucking socialists they were and how every one of their experiments failed. And the moment that you brought in like maybe capitalism light, like you mean to tell me I can grow my own beer and beans? I'm a success. Those guys were all millionaires who can change America for the good. But it hasn't caught on to this day in the schools. Isn't that how they did it? They got, they brought in their cult idea their socialism but then they piggybacked off of america built their way look at these rockefeller families and all these guys they all descended from these people they become the arch capitalists and i did this in chapter six this was from eustace mullins's book if you read murder by injection go to the last chapter the rockefeller syndicate he tells you plain as day the rockefellers actually were part of the massive financing of the communist experiment in russia which means they're all they're all they're just handling money for some of these exons we're talking about, but uh, he's like the reason they did it. They themselves are not capitalists. They are these champagne drinking socialists that are part of these nocturnal clubs that fly the banner of capitalism that help to give capitalism, which is just hey, I'm not part of feudalism anymore. Uh, they gave that the bad name that allowed the communist infiltration to have something to beat up on. But they were financing the communists. So why would David Rockefeller, the supposed capitalist, be financing the Bolshevik Revolution and Stalin? Well, they're also the same people that were financing Hitler. So I thought history Roman tells Hammer. us. Yeah, I thought I thought that it was the Nazis versus the commies. I thought it was fascism versus right. communism. It's because not. It's all great. smoke and meat. Yeah. Yep. Well, these are internationalists. They're not communist. They're not capitalists. They're communists, and they're international masons who just were rich enough to be able to ensconce themselves because that triumvirate never happened. And the voices mm -hmm. that could have warned against it weren't there to do so, both in Germany, Russia, and other places. They swept them aside. The first attempt was the civil war. That's how they tested the waters. And even though the South technically lost, we're famous for losing the wars we win. 
as every person in the military knows. They won the greater war. The, the banks, the National Bank opened up again after Andrew Jackson had tried to wipe it out and so on, so on, so on. And this, the groups that you're talking about are just internationalists. They either yeah. subsumed ordinary capitalists that came out of America early or those themselves, man, were guilty capitalists. There's no such thing as a guilty capitalist. He's not a capitalist the moment he feels guilt for what he's got or he buys into some other sort of social lie. Those men you're talking about are communitarians. They're the socialists that Ayn Rand war warned about. And although they are very, very rich, what they want to fund, you know, these, these etzois and these communitarians, look it up, you know, and all of the work we've done on that. And these people want to fund social projects that are almost straight out of Mao's little red book. Right. So they don't mind that if you call them capitalists, maybe it sounds good. And maybe they do own a few Bentleys and take, you know, have a few yachts. But their ideology is anything but. So that's part of our unveiling. The student must convince himself. I've mentioned several things that they must. This is one of them. To be able to test for Echo. <laughs> test for fucking commie. Test for Pinko, even though the guy's got a fleet of houses and a fleet of yachts. This motherfucking Hugh Hefner is a communist. Can't you see it? Right. Right. He may have all the trappings that America has sanctified or whatever, you know, this sort of cigar smoking uh, Hearst, who was his name, right? Randolph Hearst type of image. That's just Hollywood. That's just mogul stuff. Half the co half the moguls of Hollywood were communists, guys. Mayer and Selznick. Look at the content of their movies. They sold you communism long before most people had ever heard of it and crushed the movies. I've got them all listed that were anti-communist films and who acted in it. Barbara, you know, I've got all the names of the John Waynes and the Robert Taylors and the Barbara Stanwicks and the Edward G. Robinson and others who were anti-communist and Sterling Hayden, one of the most ridiculed men in Hollywood. They tried to blacklist those ass, right? All these anti-communists were in there, but they got rid of them and they put in their commie people and then they make big stars of these people. But to make big stars of your communists, you know, Humphrey Bogarts, they had to show them with capitalist trappings. So anybody who's been tracking this for a long time goes, we're going to come over here to Lauren Bacall and here we are at their mansion. Let's go through this amazing place. They're capitalists, not. And then they show the swimming pool and the fucking fleet of cars. And you go, K -k -k capitalist. <laughs> and then they start them talking and they're communists. Or they're in the you know the Senate hearings because they're communists. So in the end, the American public just can't work the fucking out because these are our great heroes on the silver screen. And they won't listen, strangely, they won't listen to the ones who are telling you there's communism rampant in Hollywood. And the moguls themselves are making films that are so patently communist and propagandist, these Howard Hawks, Hawks and, you know, all the rest of them, the ones I can name, who made the propaganda movies to demonize Germany. Not that I'm for Nazis, but Nazi and German don't mean the same thing. That's why I have the Germanophobia site. To right. show you that Germanophobia is as old as the 1790s. The French didn't forgive Germany for a lot of wars way back when, and certainly it ramped up in 1850. And then through the Bismarck era, you know, and on and on into the 20th century. So never confuse, but they did. The word Nazi and the word German are synonymous. That's already propaganda, folks. You don't need to look. And very they did far. the same. They did the same with the capitalist communist thing. And just to add That's something, right. I, it, some authors will say um, that communism and Satanism are really just the same. Uh, ideology and then you would go and say yeah but then satanism that's where we're going to track back to the Sethian cults and the ancient these ancient cults because it's all if it's a religion ideology if it's a religion if it's yeah. a religion because remember satanism is the is the sabbatean act on getting into a religion and subverting it from within that's satanic if anyone wants the real definition just in case i don't know maybe you do satanism is the is the subversion of an authentic religion we not we may not believe, be christians or jews or muslims that's beside the point a legitimate religion, right? Culturally accepted by everybody else, but it has elements within it. People don't even know this yet, or at least who they identify. But the same thing can happen to a political party, as has. it's In fact, the fragmentation is the real issue of the future. The actual fragmentation is itself probably the great act of that's going to sink the future because you haven't joined a thing five minutes before you've met some subgroup who goes, come over here and join us. We've got it all smarter. We're all smarter and we don't like them and we don't like this. This right. has happened to American conservatism with less than 100 years. So the proof is in the pudding. So you've had great patriots on both sides. I think Huey Long, he was a Catholic. So it's not that <clears throat> I think this fucking Papa Cannon is one, right? So, it's, you know, you have to go beyond the cliches. Hmm. 
you factor it in. You look at it and you say, well, that might be a weakness to me, right? It might be. But try to identify something else of credit and meaning. Right, there's Victor Marchetti. That's an Italian name. Guarantee, more than likely, that man was a Catholic. Catholic, yeah. So what? Right? There's hundreds of other authors out there so who, who are doing great work. And anyone can come out like we're human, like we're all human. We put each other in baskets and categories, but that that's collectivism. And that's that's why collectivism is evil, because um, I think you pointed out in your Jews and Templars article to to talk about those people that are just putting a big basket together and thinking the whole Jewish race is some alien species that's here to kill everybody or something. You go, look, like you can't attack all of these Jews as a group in the same way you can't attack all Italians for you know, the crimes or all Irish or all, all Irish or all uh, like I'm half Dutch. It's not all Dutch, but yeah, we definitely had some problems in our history. Look, I live in yeah. Canada. Do you think I'm, I'm getting more proud by the day? But like we have these same problems here. And so conservatively, all these are all labels. They're symbols, they're language used. It's a spell to keep you in those boxes. And now we're in camps, even with the thing we're talking about, the venom theory. Do you know that all over the Internet, all the Reddit, ever since they came out with this film? It's split everybody into these camps and they're like, oh, it's a distraction. It's this. Oh, you're one of those snake venom guys. Oh, it's this. It's the snake venom theory versus the virus theory. Then there's the people that are like viruses don't exist. And it's now there's camps. no such thing as a fucking virus. It's poison. Toxicology. It's poison. Peter is that. And, and a toxicologist can recognize those symptoms much farther than a virologist can. So then that's it's nailed. But right, these are people who. Either, it's the division. Say to them? It's the division, right? So like instead of objectively looking and saying, okay, I'm going to learn from all these different angles and just see where we can find it because we're tracking something that's hidden. We're tracking a predator, right? So you, you're going to have, you're going to get glimmers and you're going to get people coming from different camps, right? And, but in the end, you could have guys like that Baron Aver Manhattan. He's in part of the Templar. He's in the Vatican, but then he wakes up and goes, oh my God, this is evil. I'm getting out of here. I'm going to expose Nicholas Hagar. you. Nicholas Haig, coming from within. I, I give you a list. Yeah. Remember I gave you a list of hundreds of fucking people that were all insiders, and I made yep. sure they all were. There's no, uh, there's, there's some people as high as counts and dukes and stuff like that. So go yep. figure, right? And you're quite right. They, they are predators, but they are showing you that it's snakes. Just look at the caduceus on their fucking emblem. See, the, the craziest <laughs> thing about this is, it is remember, it's Scottish, right? R-I-T-E. Look up the fucking word right and find out what it means. They're not hiding anything. And Scotland is, is not who you think it is. It's not a name of a place. It's a name of a woman. If that doesn't make you fucking cringe, I don't know what does. The Scottish right has been going on since Akhenaten's fucking time. And just because there's a lot of men involved, remember the red degrees and blue degrees of masonry? Red, white, mm. and blue, mm. right? The Templars are white, and the first degrees of the Blue Lodges are blue and red. So there it is on the flags. So in the early days of these countries, knowing that America was on the rise and I had a lot of resources, this Black Lodge of the Queen. See, when Ed, when George the Third lost the war, they don't they don't lose their wars, by the way, just in case the history books confuse you. There, he gets in another way, and they're not Protestant or Catholic, right? These King Georges, like I said, they're of some filthy, degenerate, satanic house of Hanover. And they got lots of acolytes and they know how to subjugate the whole of it. By the time that George III was in, you know, power in England, William III had come and gone. And the whole of the country, that dynasty, this, this Battenberg dynasty, the Guelphs, in other words, had been sucking off the land. But they needed colonies and they wanted America. Now, Spain was there first. Portugal was there. But they seceded. They let go. And Britain found itself, you know, and France, you know, if anybody's watched, uh, you know, the movie, whatever the fuck it's called, uh, to slip my mind, you'll see the conflict in America of the French and the British, right? And so they all split up into colonies and really French repaired over to Canada more, right? And the British ended up owning in England, owning America, but owning it. It's not England. It's a colony. Doesn't people work out that this is war? That they want your land? They want revenge as well? Because of you know of the war of independence? How dare such a small population rise up against our almighty ships and then they wouldn't let go anybody ever heard of the fucking war of 1812 mm. they wouldn't let go they still fucking came and fought so there's wars after the wars so the georges and that dynasty of hanoverans and that's not to be confused with german 
as I've just tried to mention there, never ever forgave America and never has. So they bring their ministers, right? Amsterdam Jews, meaning Sabbateans, Belmont and Rothschilds, Warburg, Schiff, right? All of the groups that have up until very recently ran America and these big giant corporations. And maybe they put a Gentile out the front, you know, Merrill Lynch or something just to confuse you, right? But mostly they are going to then get to the rich, the ones that you talked about who would be maverick riches. Yeah, but don't those maverick people need insurance? Don't they need lawyers? And on and on and on as, as, as they develop. Don't they need agents and, and all sorts of people as they expand their own empires? So they may have started as capitalistic, one cigar smoking capitalist. By the time he's moved it over to a board, or he's involved with other insurance companies or expanded in any way, you lose control. Yeah, And the corporatists, right, the socialist corporatists, yeah. they understood how that works. And it's the same thing with getting people on politics. It's the same people from the secret societies of Yale and, and Harvard and Princeton. Everyone knows that Chicago University is controlled straight from London. They don't even hide it. And your John Coleman's have exposed it. And you Did think Obama that's the only one? Did Obama go to, what is, what's uh, his know. connection to I Chicago? Know. I can't remember. Maybe somebody in the chat. I thought there was a connection with Obama to Chicago for some reason, even though but we it's know not he's the not only American. One. <laughs> this goddamn Hoover Institute in Palo Alto that I went and looked around, you see, where, where, uh, where Anthony Sutton did most of his research. The Hoover Institute, they sent out 100 different agents with a million dollar checks each to buy up all the books and bookstores in Europe after war-torn Germany. And most of these things were in a pile, by the way. Buying them mm. up couldn't have been simpler. You literally are packing up crates and sending them over to the Hoover Institute. They're there to this day. So the wealth of the literature, the histories, the diaries, the memoirs, and much more that you could imagine, all the paperwork, is all in the Hoover Institute. It was the wreckage of Germany. It's like a big museum. So or a, America like, comes uh, out of yeah. the war. Right. That's what it is. You can go there. Um, there's a, It came out of the war richer than it went in. But it didn't only do that in monies physical monies. It did it in other assets as well. And this includes literature, by the way. A lot of the movies that Spielberg and other directors uh, make, and you just think, oh, it's some American director producer produced that. No, they have stacked to the ceiling literature, unknown literature from Germany, of German authors, not your Thomas Manns and the ones who are famous, but from all these lesser known writers who during the chaos of the war got forgotten about. Do you know the crates of fiction alone? They were told to send those, send those, and we'll translate those. And you're watching it on some Melrose Place or some other thing that turns Disney. up. Think of Disney. Based on German ideas. Michael, think of Disney. Yeah. All the Dude. stories Disney tells right. us, which are good yeah. stories like Cinderella. You know, all these, these are all, where do they come from? The Germanic uh, That's right. Western they do, they do. fairy tales. They do indeed. Yeah. All the grim fairy tales, all the stuff you see on Disney are rescripted. They stole <clears> it. It's the thesis I've had for years. Stolen yeah. and plagiarized. They put another person's name on it. And then yeah. it turns up in Hollywood. But the ransacking of a culture. And what I'm trying to say is Germany was the target from centuries back. So the war on Germany is a whole separate subject. I've done a little website on it just to put the basics there so people can connect some dots. The Holocaust and all does play a role in all of that. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but it's a multiple tiered attack. You see, it's not just Jews, you know, wanting to hate Germany, hate on Germany. Hey, that could be for legitimate reasons. I, I don't, I'm not a Nazi and I don't like the Nazis. I know who they were. They're part of this multi-tiered attack. Its roots are in Catholic socialism, believe it or not. And I make the case in the Thule Society, premium if people haven't seen it, they can watch that, put two and two together. It was a heavily occult, but this time in order to make it work, they had to draw on Eastern occultists as well. Western occultists was full steam ahead, but they needed more. They weren't strong enough. They didn't have as many warlocks involved, even for their power, even for their considerable power. So they brought in through Karl Haushofer. He he was he grew up uh, studying Chinese. He was a Chinese, an Oriental scholar, as many of them actually were. Many you'd be amazed how many Nazis were actually Oriental scholars. And then getting back to the Islamo-Communism thing, the Pan-Arabic movement and the Pan-Turkic movement after the fall of Germany. Guess where all those Orientalists went? Some went to Switzerland, some went to other countries, but a lot of them went to Uruguay, the famous rat line. We do know mm. about that. But although that has been written about, there was a mass movement of these Nazis, meaning socialists, to Arab, to the Arabic lands, 
where they were treated like absolute royalty and became advisors to the Grand Mogul, who was a friend of, uh, not the Grand Mogul, the Mufti, the Grand Mufti of Egypt, who was a personal colleague of Adolf Hitler. You can see photographs of them together. Look up Hitler and Grand Mufti of Egypt. There it'll be. And of a man called President Bose. And he was Hindu, right? He was the president of France who strongly supported Hitler. People don't know that, that the president of Hitler, the president of India formed a detachment of the Nazi army in India. But he was Hindu, but so did the Muslims. This has been all suppressed because Islamo-Communism is now one of the greatest threats of our time. And therefore, all the, the press is suppressing it. Right? So those Germans went and learned Arabic, if they already hadn't learned it. And they formed a new Nazi movement that is now infecting Iran. You could still bring Iran down. We've had guests on who speak about that. And other nations as well. A long-term plan. Because when the Ottoman Empire fell, another very strong uh, bastion of the world fell. A, a culture. A culture that could have you know, done something about communism. But unfortunately, socialists in the form of the Young Turks had risen to the top of the government there. And that's a story that needs to be told. Egypt, look at that. We, what is Egypt Grand Mufti, a Muslim, doing with the Nazi leader? You mean the communist leader, the socialist leader? He's just so, he's just left of center. He's just right of center, but the center is not a true right. He's a right wing communist. In other words, right, the middle class version of socialism or the working class version. Communism is the working class version of socialism. Fascism is the middle class and upper class version of socialism. Wow. And until and that that's is understood. Your, that's your Islamo-communism door, is that connection. Uh, how the And that goes all the way back. Wow, it's making so much sense. Michael, there's so many things. Like You're just a wealth of knowledge. Guys, you got to go check out his site. If you go to michaeldesarian.com, all of Michael's websites are there. And each website is a different subject with just scores of research to, to dig on. But I had one more question for you, Michael, that I was curious about. It kept popping to mind while you were talking about a lot of stuff today. And I was just curious if you took a look at this. You were talking about Hugh Hefner, the champagne socialists, the infiltration of Hollywood, the Sabbateans. These history, the Sabbateans. So here's this Epstein Island. There's a temple on it. Uh, God knows how many elites went there or what they did there. But um, I, it just look at that. So everybody's going to go, oh, it's just because it's an old Jewish temple. But there's something more Egyptian about this to me. What do you see here? Oh, no, I've explained this in uh, one of the articles. I think it's uh, five or six on the female Illuminati site. Okay. <clears throat> Remember that the Atonists merged with the Parthians, and then the Parthians come over, as Ralph Ellis shows, into Syria? Right? It's the same group. Right. They're Atonists, but they're Muslim Atonists. And there's a Jewish tie-in because of the marriage in with a few elite Jews back then. So it's not that I've ever denied a Jewish connection. There are. But this is the real connection. Why I wrote that article is to show you the real Jewish connection. If you have to keep on blaming Jews for everything, then at least know what the fuck you're talking about. Right? The Parthian, Atonist, Syrian connection. And that's Merovingian too, because I said the same group, Parthian, Syrian, Edessan, are the ones that marry, right? The red-headed woman with her Thea Muse, Arania, her mother, that crowd goes over to France. They're the part of the Merovingian who had the hook nose, and that's where the Jewish William de Gallon comes in. And he's the ancestor of the British house and the Dutch house of Orange that we're talking about. But the house of Orange is Orange Nassau. It's a, it has a German connection. You see as well, they're all, all of the all of the royal families are all. But you've got to you know, go through it and do as I've done to show that who they are. And Ralph Ellis is the expert on the French connection. But the French connection going back through the the Merovingians. Now that temple there is just a very good uh, example of yeah what you could call basically the Sabbatean, you know, proto like a, cu a cult with a cult within a cult. And we know um, even I was playing. This was in chapter four of Cult of the Medics. I went into the ancient practice of ritual sacrifice, right? And there was even I couldn't even believe this clip made it onto Oprah Winfrey in the 90s where she's interviewing some woman who's saying she comes from a jewish family who 
literally sacri- does human infant sacrifice and that these these types of families all over America, this is what she was telling Oprah. And Oprah was like talking about it like this is normal discussion. It was in, I couldn't believe I found this clip. And then um, we got into the ancient cults of, of the sacrifice. And even it, it wouldn't always be a human. It would just be the, the act of, you know, the sacrificial to the gods. Right. And these are, this is everywhere. And this is a cult within a cult that goes to the ancient connections you're talking about. And who are the gods you really think they're going after? Why is it this bloodthirsty god cult or goddess? Cult? It's actually a goddess cult. And that's when you bring that's in all it. that. So all that talk about the Abramovich and the adrenochrones and the weird blood rituals and the children and the human trafficking and the thing. It's because they look at you like a different species almost. They look at you like you're cattle and that it's part of their ritual to appease those well, gods, you know, goddesses. <laughs> Yeah, but see, it's more than that. You are their offspring. The goddess has her offspring. She's only taking well, back blood yeah. that she gave out in the first place. So it's a nuanced ritual. So Jelaine Maxwell, probably a Sabatine, who knows, right? The other Abramoviches. So they have found in their rituals, it's a goddess tradition. And they take the ritual as a sign of, we're just bringing back to ourselves our offspring. Yeah, that's how they And look at they it. must Psycho. have found. Yeah, and then obviously... These people used to be part of cults that ate raw meat. But as I go into in, uh, I think even Path of the Fool's ending, the last card, you know, I talk about this uh, Venus. I think it's one of the articles as well. Venus, uh, uh, Eros connection. There's a very, see, if you look up, if you went back to that one with the red head with a serpent, you'll notice that the serpent is right between her legs in a sexually provocative, I don't know if you still have that up. <clears throat> so there's a sexual aspect. I just forget what. But I then people would balk. We're just trying to ex- explain the connections between the symbols mm-hmm. that people might who are novices. Michael, I thought you said it was her cub, her her little snake cub. What's sex got to do with it? That's right. Read the Aphrodite Eros uh, myth, and you'll realize there is Aphrodite and Eros, Venus and uh, Cupid. You know, or Aphrodite and Cupid and Venus and Eros, whichever one it is, because the, the Greeks were the originators of some of this. The Romans, you know, adopted just wholesale. So it's the Greek prototypes that you really want to look at. Uh, now, the serpent connection, <clears throat> you don't see it as being her offspring. But you would never, even if you did, you wouldn't think sex was involved. Because that's because you know fuck all about what anything. Right? In the mythology, the goddess mates first and foremost with her own child. As years went by, it could be a priest representing that child possessed. You see this in the movie, To the Devil, a Daughter. Please watch it with educated eyes. That's that level where a priest can stand in for the God. Originally, there was no standing in. Is this the origin of all this pedophilia going on in all these religions, all these cults? Like the, is this, is this why they, they, because of that, it come, that's the lineage of that whole idea of where that came from. Well, you can't rule out the dirty old man thing. I mean, just look right. at the state of them sitting on but the But there's female pedophiles cardinals. too. Right. There's female but, yeah, pedophiles ritualist- too. Yeah, yeah. So ritualistically, yeah. And the female pedophile has more right to be a pedophile in this sense that we're talking now based in goddess traditions. See, the very things, that, if you go to astrotheology. astrotheologyzone.net or .com, you'll see all of this stuff about the goddess cults and what they used to do. You know, like a thousand of them would descend on a valley, run down and grab a bull and just tear it to pieces with their bare hands, eat the meat, and then lie around in blood-soaked, you know, a little bit like modern ad copy. Yeah, ever. Just just pointing out one of its ancient... So gorged on blood and semen and bull balls and the whole nine years, and obviously alcohol of some kind, no doubt. Um... uh, then they would gorge, you know, and then they go into trances because then they take the poppy seed or whatever, or they go into caves and they'd have all these visions. So when you see the goddess with a little child sitting there, often lots and lots of ornaments of a goddess figure with a child on her knee would be found in the caves, you know, most of these figurines. And it showed, it. people started to get a realization that there was something odd about that. And it really led to the idea that even when these women were pregnant, they took fucking massive doses of this drug. 
So the fetus was drenched in just like they whistleblow in the movie Dune. If you know how to watch that with educated oh, eyes, okay. then you'll get you'll you'll see it being whistleblown there that the worm, right, which floats around in this sort of solution, this amniotic. The worm is the child, the little one, the the baby worm. You see, that's going to become this massive thing. It's all it's all this ancient uh, Middle Eastern symbolism that Frank Herbert again, like Professor Tolkien, knew how to cover up. Now, there's many movies that whistleblow this and whistleblow the connection to the woman and the serpent. Uh, so, so the pedophilia is only the ritualistic aspect will be to devour the, the, but it also can mean that you've devoured the semen of the child. You milk the child for its semen under special astrological periods, especially connected to Venus and hey, maybe the moon, right? But I, all I know is Venus is, plays a part in this and con and con and one of the most important one is the 240 or 280 year conjunction between Mercury and Venus that happens, you know, in the bigger cycle every 200 years. All the great temples, including the Temple of Solomon, but many Masonic halls are have been specifically aligned with that one. They wait that long to build a new temple, the ones even in our cities. And that conjunction in Jewish secret lore is called Shekinah. So, you know, the Shekinah, meaning the female uh, aspect of God. No, yeah. it's in its astro-theological, and they're the oldest cults. The Shekinah was a day, a period of two, three days or whatever, when the movement of Mercury and Venus were coming together. Those two gods was considered Harus Gamas. You see it in the Egyptian at the top of the page that you opened, you know, with my serpent symbolism, or Jeb and Nut. So it comes from the old, old, not just Egypt, but old, old rituals. Well, they bloody well perform this fucking ritual. And then at other times when the, uh, it's not an exact con conjunction, but there's other times when there's uh, important four aspects, you know, the four cardinal points when it's a opposition and, and the two, uh, <clears throat> what the hell is the other one? Uh, 90 degree angle. <clears throat> These ritual peoples will do similar rituals at 90 degree and then 880 degree angle to the Shekinah through the years. That gives them more rituals to do, right? And some of them is to sacrifice a child. But I think what it is, is that it's the uh, ritual abstraction while the child is alive of the semen. And that goes into the concoction, into the soma, and the mother will actually imbibe it. And once that's done, so they're married. Gross. Yeah, yeah, it's wow. gross. They, it's, uh, 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 it, and also the child will be under hallucinogenics when this ritual happens. So it's out. Mm. Maidens will come in. Very, very beautiful maidens, but they're under strict orders not to mate with the child. They just arouse the child and take into a chalice, the Templar chalice. Uh, I show that on the female Illuminati site. The Holy Grail is this, right? And in it goes the castrated genitals. That used to be one time they would do the full castration. That They stopped doing that, and they just would abstract the juice, mix it with poppy seeds and other hallucinogenics. The child, though, is already under hallucinogenics while this whole fucking thing is going on. You'd have to be if you're going to be castrated, right? No two ways about it. Then he became the head castrate, the head eunuch. It's where the cult of eunuchs come from. Just look it up. And it wasn't it's just another weird ass cult. Yeah, This thing is so ancient. It's unbelievable. That's where the head is shaved of the priests because they stopped cutting off the real genitalia. And they just said, we'll shave our heads to represent that we're castrati. Yeah. So then these motherfuckers, it goes back to Shiva, you know, and it also goes back to sh cutting your own penis off, right? Shriners have that big saber sword uh, with the head of Akhenaten in it. So the Shriner is of the highest oh. degree because he either has gone through the real castration, and I mean real, or more likely as time went by, a symbolic is when you're a Shriner. Fuck knows they may be actually really doing it. So it's not pedophilia. Well, look today, Michael, the with child, the transgender stuff. And the fact that they're saying, let's do surgical mutilations on children and turn them into the other gender. Like, there's a ritual component to all that, too. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, raw. <clears throat> they don't look at it as pedophilia when they have the child. The child still got a penis, still can admit semen. So in some bizarre ritual that they have, the child becomes the, the surrogate penis. This has actually happened. That's what a Shiva oh lingam God. is. It's evil. So, yeah, it's all to do with anointing and weird shit. But the female would then take from her only begotten son, the semen, right, and the concoction, she'd take it. The kid was already under hallucinogenic shit, doesn't really know what the fuck is going on. 
he then lives the rest of his life as a celibate priest, which is what the Catholic Church College of Cardinals do. So they're all castrati. And, and that you know, inflicts a trauma. Where, that afflicts the trauma on that child for the rest of their lives. And then they no, end up, not, it, no? Biologically, it does. Psychosomatically, he's heavily traumatized. But mentally, yeah, he believes yeah. he's a god. Because at that point, he sacrificed his penis and therefore becomes a god in his mother's eyes. And the consort. He is now queen's consort. So he's not really mind He's mind controlled out of any kind of other trauma. He believes that that's a necessary sacrifice as it would be when you, you know, like circumcision today is our still version of it, by the way. The Jews, right? And the Arabs, all these fucking loons right. who do this is the small symbol of man becoming God at the behest of his mother. All that tribal shit they show, it's not the males doing it. it that is the sacrifice, just like a sun dance wounding that the Native American Indians do, the castration, the circumcision is a woman thing. That's why women need to stop it now. Because it's all your fucking ritual cult shit going down. That that child has been has been gone through this ritual. If I if I circumcise my son, that is the emblem for all time that you know we've gone through this agape ritual. She keeps They're now his, the eunuch. Yeah, and she keeps. In the glass, the days they used to cut off the genital completely, she'd keep that. That was her symbol. That that's my that's my real son. And uh, it was always figured as her standing upon a cub, or in the state in the state of Sabel, two lions. Right. So she's not a very important goddess, right? Britannia sits in a chair, just like Sabel, with a lion at her feet. The goddess uh, Sweden. Is named after the word Sveri, or you could say Sver Rig, you know, Rig meaning Reich, Reich, of Sver, Sver. Who is Sver? Sweden is named after a goddess who sits in a great throne holding a five pointed pentagram with two lions. That's Sabel. Sabel symbol was a circlet. S V E A Svea. Sweden is named after a goddess. Europe is named after a goddess. Britain is named after a goddess. Asia is named after a goddess, and so is uh, uh, Persia. Now, now there's a Statue of Liberty in America, right? But the thing I want to mention is Sabel's actual logo symbol is a circlet, a little round circlet, like a zodiac, you know, or just a plate, or a circumcised penis. And she is the lion. And the lion cub is Mithra, whose name is even chosen to represent the female. What the fuck is male about it? When all the, the only thing is fucking male about this is when Constantine came along, put his personal fucking solar stamp on it, a mixture of, you know, six or seven different cults, the cult of Serapis, the cult of Sol Invictus, the, and Mithra. the Mithraic cult Mithraic. and a bit of Zoroastrianism thrown in. And that's, by the way, we just know it as Christianity, in case anybody was in any doubt. But the or thing the is, the, the whole yeah. birth and the manger and all that palava. Yeah. So Mother Mary then is Sabel, obviously. It's a Sabel cult. And she holds that circlet to represent, you know, the cutting of the circlet, which would forever represent you're under, you are sacrificed to me. So all men who've been circumcised are, are ready for the ritual. We may not get to you, but... Basically, you're one of my people and you can be sacrificed at any fucking moment and I can suck your fucking juices anytime I want. And so where this comes to Hugh Hefner is because he didn't unleash rock and roll, but he released everything else, sex and the drugs, because these Sabbatean motherfuckers are there to arouse a nation and to get them down into their lower chakras, to get them to be wooed by women Distracted. and all the other shit. Yeah. yeah, all the cult of it. It's a cult. It's a cult. I don't care if she's draped over a fucking Ferrari or a bar of fucking chocolate. Or sitting there with some serpent wrapped around her. Look, dude, I know where it all comes from. And I know that the women are just dying for their girls to read those magazines and go out and become the next fucking model. Isn't that right? You, you're surrounded by these mothers. You don't notice it? That they're the ones allowing the daughters to watch the magazines, like we said at the end of Female Illuminati. When is this a male problem? The male is the drool. That's his only job. And get aroused. So he's bleeding off his fucking vital energy with it all. Understand the ritual that's going on? I keep telling you it's ritualistic. Nobody wants to listen. It's all ritualistic. And and this stuff, um, just to sort of bring it all home, all of the cult, weird, freaky stuff in all of this goes back to the two things that we've been talking about a lot on Unslave, which is the ancient 
cataclysm trauma and the interference, the intervention, the, the genetic alteration, the alien DNA. And when you factor those two things in, it'll make sense why you got all these different groups from the Mayans to the, all these di the, the different religious groups in these cults who they're doing this for and maybe even where they learn some of this from and how they well, see it. The person who hears that for the first time can't believe it because they don't read. Hmm. You factor in the ancient pre-Atlantean stuff because they wrote it down that the gods are here to make man out of the clay and he's called Adam or that we want a servant race that we will hybridize. It's in the scriptures, the Enuma Elish, the Bundahash, right? And all the scriptures that I mentioned throughout my work. It's yeah. the Popol Vuh. It's there, people. It is there. Nothing is invented. You, 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 it's in Genesis. You bring it in, like I said, the women didn't resist. Any, yeah. How many people do you know have read the book of Genesis? Millions down through all this time. There isn't one scholar I've ever come across who asked, why did the women not fight back? And added to what's the book of Enoch, that there were handsome angels. And then I, I throw in a few more. That, that should be enough. That they offered power. But the beauty of the angel seduces the women. It's even in the Bible, biblicists do accept that. They acknowledge that because Lilith was, again, you know, a beautiful temptress. And also, that's not too far-fetched, that one. And you do have women all the way through the Bible who represent that same aspect. Okay. They, they ascribe it to about, Lucifer as well. As they do indeed. And that actually comes out of Irish mythology, go figure. But the thing is, wait a minute. If women had already a inbuilt organic repulsion to males, could the technology that was offered them by the fallen angels not be extra attractive? And what is that superiority that men have over women and always have? Physical strength. I am the only one to bring up the fact when I deal with these researchers that that was envied. It's in the, it's in the epic of Gilgamesh. You do find traces of it. But the thing is, it's quite obvious to me that women have always envied men for their physical prowess, strength, and endurance. Always. It's organic. It, I'm not even fighting it. I'm not even saying it's a bad thing. I would envy it. Right. But if the right force came in and said, ah, bleh, 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 fuck that, fuck that, fuck that. Look at the power we've got. Look at this laser weapon. Look at these ointments. Look at this. Look at the power pharmacia. we can make with a pharmacia. Mm. The women are just like, fucking sign me up. And that's why I connect those dots and believe that there's a female cult who learned this specific uh, technologies, as the great Blavatsky's and others let you know, it's all there. The Mahabharata, right? The goddesses of blood, it's all there. And that they retaliated on men and hybridized a whole bunch of uh, the rest of them as pigs. The women connection is there because the house of Ninlil was the house of the, of the splitting of the rib. She was lady of the rib. So they tried their best in the Bible to, you know, use euphemisms, but it's quite fucking obvious that the goddess was the one who really made man, the man, Adam, who would be thrown out of the garden of paradise, lost everything, crawl around in the mud, like we're still doing, right? Watching the game, Netflix, head the pub, right? Look at the logos, they're on the shit, you're drinking your fucking piss pots. Just take a fucking look. You think this is old? Just take a look around at the symbolism of your Starbucks and the whole fucking slew of it. And you'll a story will unfold. Their logos and their emblems and their symbols and their words are all over the stuff that you're still imbibing and poisoning the shit out of yourself. But the, but the ritual says, go ahead, remote control dickhead. Go and fucking do it. Or go out and die on my wars. Or inject yourself with something. Or when you get a bit sick, run off to that mendicant. Hmm. That fucking it's sorcerer in white. Even yeah. the war. They'll give you ritual. some serpent piss. You know, it'll all, it'll all be over real soon. Don't you worry. We've tested it for years on animals and jail birds. Remember the hospitalers? People walked into their hospital free will, dripping with leprosy and all sorts of you couldn't even imagine the VD alone, right? Well, you lost your fucking rights. They didn't even have you sign something. You're on death's door, mate. You go, doctor, help. And that, that was all they needed to say, try this and try that and try, oh, that fucker died. He's as stiff as a board. Take him out, throw him into the pigs. Next. And they ch tested it out from the medieval times, the crusades, where hospitals all over the world were filled with people with diseases you can't even imagine. Maggot infested fucking people, right? And they just said, my God, this is amazing because we can test. We're helped by these Saracens. They know a lot about it. This weird female cult we just met over there, what are they up to? That's been whistleblown. 
let's go and get some of them and you know see what they're all about those those fucking helens when we see them out there at certain times of the moon and dancing about and all we've got to get to find out what they're all about and they did to learn their the art assassins. basically they the huh? assassins i was going to say yeah yeah and they many groups that you didn't even believe that's why i added a little bit from uh what's his name that fucking david livingstone nutter right i did add a little bit from his book to just show you that some historian at least has delved into the oriental cults because ralph's is really the best you know but these uh, nabataeans and these herods <clears throat> herods had family domains in france as well as they had in rome and in, in in the middle east so this is an international family as i said they always are but you know there's good books out there that i wanted or not good books but at least enough to show i'm can back this up because these old oriental uh and middle eastern you know these orontids these comedians there's all Eastern Illuminati. We even did a whole Eastern Illuminati thing. Oh, and I, I tried that. to go into that in depth yeah. because that was women controlled. These Parthians were women controlled. Um, and there is a big uh, Sabbatean because the Sabbateans influence both. They infiltrated both Islam and Judaism. So they can have structures like the one you showed that ha sort of blend things together. Yeah, but when I, in the article I have there on the female Illuminati site, when I go into that temple, I point out the presence of a group called the Gaionum. All Freemasonry is really comes from a group called the Gaionum. They come from elite Sadducees who also were displaced when Rome had to, was forced, and I repeat, forced to come in to destroy Judea. Judea, they didn't want to do that. And when they did, they did it in such proportions, they leveled the temple and they disbanded all the 150 Boogaloo, Monty Python groups that came out of that fucking place. And one of them, people, Christians know the Sadducees. Now they're the most elite group and they have an occult level of them. They moved east to Babylon. And set up temples exactly like that. So hmm. whoever built that temple, what's his name? Epstein? Epstein is not a Jew. Epstein is a Sabbatean who designed a temple based in what you used to see the Gaionum living in, part Jew, part Islam, because they're living on courtesy of Islam. Islam f smiles on them, let them do what they want. But they're Jews. Well, Ep what's his name? Epstein is not the only one. This is a cult that you don't know anything about. Right? That explains the, the that explains the Mossad connection with Maxwell, I think. Oh yes, they're the, the same group. You know, yeah, the secret yeah. society. The Sabbateans are a secret society. So of course you're going to be finding them in the CIA, MI5, Mossad, the Five Eyes. They, yeah. They're teaching them how to do it, mate. Work with the codes and the watermarks and secret and all. Yeah, they can draw upon them. But the Sadducees became the Gaionum, the capital G, as I pointed out. Till I'm blue in the fucking face, is a serpent. The, the lowercase g of lowercase. Gaonum, which is on the masonry with a blazing star of the comet or the Shekinah, if you will, then, you know, on a different level, because there's different interpretations. But the g is only one interpretation, only once, not God, not geometry, not goddess, Gaonum, because they were the Freemasons. And the g on their, you know, back in the Babylon, there's three or four cities that they set up headquarters in. The g showed, oh, that's Gaonum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We respect, we respect, leave them alone. You know, the Muslims would just leave them alone. Probably because you didn't want to die some fucking snake venom as you're guzzling your wine at the bazaar. <laughs> yeah. These motherfuckers come after you, asshole. They're fucking going to fuck with you. That's why you leave them alone. Right? So the G is this lowercase serpent. The guy on them are the fucking med the, the Parthians. They're the fucking, they come back in as our Freemasons. But there's an Eastern side. That's why you don't ever heard about guy on them. Because that's, you have to track the Eastern side, you know, of the Illuminati to get to them. Otherwise, it's just Freemasons coming out of, you know, what's the normal story? I don't know, fucking the normal story, right? You know, Freemasons appear in Europe or whatever. Yeah. With your Rosicrucians and whatever. You got to go back. There's an Eastern connection. But the serpent symbol is Gaonum. That serpent symbol is being shown to you during the ritual. The medical people use it as they use these other crosses from the Mediterranean pirates and incredible. So you think it's all fucking holy, right? You're born in white and you die in black. It's the same fucking guy. It's the same guy standing there. He just puts on a different hat. Just to let you know. Wow. No, your enemy. No, at least if you're gonna overthrow somebody, at least know where they live and something about their fucking the way they've been, you know, performing rituals on your fucking ass for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's yeah. all Shiva worship, it's all phallic worship. They they've incorporated all this Judaism, elite Judaism, 
And then when the fucking Sabbateans got involved, they went, we like this. We talk, don't, we love that part of Jews and we're going to appropriate it into our satanic rituals. Jews had already dropped it. If you, when you watch my stuff on the Jews, I'll tell you the real history of the Jews. The Jews were not into Jehovah. The Jews were not even religious. You people don't know what you're talking about. It was one big bomb fire full of fucking, you know, bric-a-brac that nobody wanted to do anything with. Jews were not into the Old Testament shit. Find out the facts. The Khazar thing's a total lie. We did that and showed that meticulously. And the whole thing of a Jewish conspiracy is a bollocks. But the wreckage of, a, of Judaism lay in the Greek and Roman empires for anyone who wanted to go through it and say, oh, well, that part, the apothecary part, or that Kabbalah part, or that goddess part, or that Jove worship and serpent worship and all that. So that was all reappropriated in Alexandria, right, and in, in the Greek empire, and became this monster that no real Jew could ever recognize in him because of so many Grecian elements and Gentile elements. And then along comes Paul. We know who he was, Josephus Flavius, Josephus Flavius, who does, who does the same thing. One man, Josephus Flavius, coming in and doing exactly what I've just described, only on steroids to bring in Gentile elements of the sun worship and Mithras and Persia and fucking Serapis and Saul Invictus, merge it in with occult Judaism to create something so fucking evil and rotten. Everybody went for it. Of course they do. They love it. They don't want the czar's wine. They want some Pepsi Cola. Well, he just handed them the you know, Pepsi Cola, the best stuff they'd ever had. And they all slurped down on it. Oh, uh, a small matter of killing off anybody who stood up to resist it. And we got Christianity. It's still going live and well today. And those motherfuckers over in the Vatican are killing themselves. They know all about it, this College of Cardinals. They're so fucking evil. You don't know what shit they're into. It takes forever to, you know. And a lot of it is correcting the work that other people have written. I love those people. I'm not against them. I'm for it. Because my work is built out of the error in their systems. Then I have compressed it in the websites that you mentioned, female Illuminati, all that is all compressed. Hundreds and hundreds of books and what feels like centuries of research just to you know tease out a, a few pure aspects i'm not interested if you believe it or not i know i've studied it i've fucking met it up front i've connected the dots i've read the books the great tomes history books tell you sadducees just kind of disappeared when the vatican you know came uh, when when the when the romans conquered judea that's what you believe Sure, the Jews tell you that that's not the case, but they tell you in code. And I have it all on the Austrotheology website. Now, peoples, peoples of that power don't just disappear. Like I mentioned in Irish Origins, the Civilization book, the one group that was in with the Romans more than any other group in the world was the Sadducees. Coincidence. So they all get wiped out by the Romans. They've got family, dynastic, and mercantile connections going back hundreds and hundreds of years after you know the Romans took over from the Greek Empire. The Sadducees were in with both those empires. They were the merchant priests of Judea. They don't disappear. Their families were one with Roman blood. They, I mean, they don't disappear in the sense that they were wiped out. They just moved. Can just we... like the Templars. They That's didn't it. get eliminated. They just went underground and changed face. And they were earlier Templars. The Sadducees and the Templars are connected. Remember I said the people think they're connected to the Essenes? I don't know if that's true. Now, there's some evidence that it is true. But it's a little bit slim. And after what I have discovered about the Sadducees, to me, the connection with the Templars is with the Gaionum. The Sadducees, not the Essenes, although they definitely can be ble bleeding over. But the strength, the, the connection with the Sadducees, who are the Gaionum, is far, far more replete, for me anyway, in terms of the Templar connection. Because the Templar is not one connection. There are multiple orders and multiple degrees within the order. The nine main knights. But who's this elusive order of Sion? Does that mean that the Gaionum had a female aspect? That the one thing unique about Sadducees is that they let women join, whereas the Pharisees did not and other Jewish groups do not? We don't know. Still looking at it. But all I know is that temple that you show, up uh, Epstein, is a sad is a Gaionum structure in Babylon in the Middle East, but it has Jewish colors and Jewish elements, and it was allowed and permissible, and there was even respect, and there might have even been terror. You know, if given what I think, they're serpent cult. <clears throat> but never think that just because I'm again mentioning elite Jews that you're only dealing with a, a brotherhood of the snake. That I think that doesn't work. So Jelaine Maxwell or anybody like that, I think they had female aspects. I think they had wives. 
I think they she had was daughters. in more control. She, you, the, you can look even at the evidence they're finding is that she was way higher ranked than some Epstein. He was the chump that they kind of put all over the media. But yeah, Maxwell is so. one of those controls. And he got clients. sacrificed, didn't he? He's dead. Yeah. He's alive. I think I might tell us something there. Yeah. But look, in my article three on the female Illuminati site, I talk about the order of Rebecca. Middle Eastern name, right? Hmm. Jewish name, right? What does it stand for? It's an order of Rebecca in Masonry. There's several. You can get out a big map of, uh, like I do in the article, I show you the different orders of the women. Rebecca was the second name, the original birth name of Joseph Frank's daughter. Ever heard of the Frankists? When the old evil bastard finally expired, his order was taken over by his daughter, who's called Rebecca. There you are. Her name was Eve, her, her secret society name. So the order of Eve now, and they have the gold and the brown, which is the symbol of the clerics, by the way, as well. Uh, she takes over the Sabbateans. So Sabbatai Zave died, probably in his own filth. Frank died. His daughter took over. This order is a female order. So, so I put this on the female Illuminati site just to point out that if you have to talk about female Illuminati, there are many candidates for that and masonry knows all about it the order of the eastern star all the ones we list in the female illuminati program one after the other the french ones and they're still alive today and they're the power behind the throne and often they let you know it so rebecca is one of these what's called domne you may have heard that term muslim jew sounds bizarre doesn't it Domne, look it up, D-O-M-N-E-H, the Domne. They have other names as well. Well, these were Jews who did well under Islam. This explains the Turco-Ottoman Empire I'm speaking of, which was technically a Turkish Islamic empire, but it had Jews in the senior positions. Nothing unusual about that. It's because they're very hardworking and thrifty and mathematical and keep good books and work like fucking white man will one day maybe learn if history is long enough or not more the case. So the Domne are also have a secret society level. They have their own Masonic society. It's not Islamic. It's not Christian. It's not Jewish. It's a bit of a blend of everything, right? And it's the same reason why you walk into a Masonic hall today and see the Bible, and it will always be with a Quran and a Torah. This is coming out of the, this group that I'm talking about. Their headquarters was Thessalonica, used to be called Salonica in the Ottoman Empire. More powerful than you can imagine. Probably even more powerful than uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This is an empire that's little known because of these bizarre elements that came fucking crumbling to the ground. And I just made the anecdote about that they were enemies of Russia and all of that, right? But this group of Masonic super Jews were basically not Jews. We have to, we run up against this problem again. It all goes back to Egypt too, right? That's what people have to yeah. remember. <coughs> oh, yeah. Now, Ralph Ellis confirms everything I'm saying because he is the one who researched the fate of Baghdadi Jews under Islam and how well they did until finally one of the mullahs ripped them off of all their millions. Up until that time, Baghdadi Jews were the richest merchants in the Islamic countries. And they did a lot of the mercantile. So they spoke Arabic. They had Arabic habits and customs, etc. Right? Uh, you know, they adopted some of the I wouldn't call it pedophilia, but they may have adapted some of these boy lover things. You know, there's all sorts of features that came with the culture, right? Now, the thing is, and also some of the architecture, just a long way of explaining why Epstein had that feature. Because they adopt, there's the connection, and it's a fucking important connection. It, it's a part of masonry yeah. they don't want you to know about, and it's part of secret society lore they don't want you to know about. So that's why all the other writers, and this, this imbecile living stone is the only one I could find to cite who does, you know, he's a nutter, right? But he's got some pieces, not as much as Ralph. But Ralph will show you in his narratives about the Baghdadi Jews that there would be no Islam today if their administration and their tax collecting was not f furnished by Jews. Confirmed by what you can study in Spain. Spanish Jews ran the Moorish Empire. Begrudgingly, because they didn't want to become the victims, all right? I can understand it. So they were hired and said, we'll keep you fuckers alive and maybe give you a little bit of privilege if you become our viziers, our accountants, because we're all a bunch of fucking Allah worshipping nutheads, all that stuff about Abacus and all that stuff about the, the Alhambra temple and all that stuff about preserving the Greek documents, 
lie. Would well, that have been during the El Cid Rodrigo Diaz story, where he's yes. now going against both the Moorish invasion and his people in his own court that were betray betraying Spain? They were, they were, they were, they were, they were, they had this preserved. The Sephardic Jew, what we call a Sephardic Jew, was a traitor <clears throat> to that extent, but he, he had no choice. And the Jews have always been the sixth class citizens. So what are you going to do? Be wiped out to a man? These Muslims are not fucking about. They're a hiring staff. And since you people are the ones, so all that stuff about, oh, Arabic mathematics, they can find two or three. The, ha the most people who ran the entire Arabic world from east to west were Jews. And they just got into the habit of doing it because you'd be fucking wiped out if you didn't. Now, the intolerant West doesn't understand that you'd be doing the same fucking thing. And Christians actually did. Now, this is all whistleblown. Go get the movie out, Nostradamus, the one from the 90s. When Nostradamus finally meets the, uh, this Jewish teacher, it's the Jewish teacher who takes him down into the basement of his house to show him all the Kabbalistic things and the things about prophecy. Showing you exactly what I'm talking about. They converted, they became Murano Jews, which means Christianized Jews later on, under the Christian edict. But many of them became Muslim, like Epstein is showing you, right? What I'm trying to point out here, and I can't remember the name, uh, that if you converted to Islam, what you were. But under the Moorish Empire, it was a fucking demand. It's either the dungeon. You had to pick, yeah. Hideous fucking death, or you become one of us. So the Jews knew that, look, we'll be disguised. We choose these motherfucking Islamic sons of bitches because at least, you know, in the daily, daily, we dress up like them and nobody will be able to tell us the difference and we'll get a bit of time to concoct what we're going to do fucking next. Right? And it is Jews that did the money lending, which saved Europe because Islam doesn't have usury and neither does the stupid ass Christians until the Templars came along. But long before and after that, Jews were the only people that you could borrow money off to get yourself out of the fucking rat hole that you were in. Now, the anti-Semites are complaining about Yezri, Yezri, because the Bible says, fuck the Bible and fuck you. Your family can die in poverty. Ever seen the Robin Hood stories? Owning one pig and then the fucking Lord coming along and on a drunken night, steal it and kill it, and then your whole family fucking died. Your only way out of abject poverty for thousands upon thousands of years was Jewish money lending, by the way. And so most of the landed gentry and most of the people that came out of the working class in the 1700s and the 1500s and the people that became the middle class, the ones that we're all descended from, borrowed money for Jews and paid it back dutifully. All good. But Christianity didn't lend you no money. They let you slave under the Pope. They let you have your eyes put out if you couldn't find the taxes. They cut off your arm if you stole a deer in the king's forest. And cut off both of them if you were caught again. They cut out your tongue, just as recent as the 1500s, folks. So while the Jew is doing well himself, personally, all over the world, and modernizing the fucking world, but he's also helping anybody. He ain't no racist. He's not saying, oh, you're fucking Gentile. You're fucking Catholic. I can't lend you any money. They, in fact, they take on you know danger to lend to somebody. But they knew, look, we have to accept that danger. If we've committed to doing this, then it's a commitment. Sorry, mate. So they are the ones who are the brave ones who may move fucking civilization forward where it really counts. You're ordinary man and woman. I want to open a little mill. I want to be a baker. I want to, I'm a musician. I want to buy a better fucking loot. If I, if I can get some little business going of charts, I'll, I'll be hired by the shipping companies to make little charts and things like that. But who am I going to borrow the money from? No Christian and Muslim. Start fucking thinking, people. Get your fucking facts together. And if you've got to accuse people, accuse the right fucking ones. That's what I'm said from day one. I'll accuse. I'll call out. But I'll do it with fucking information and knowledge. These fucking Guyana motherfuckers are the Sadducees of old. Yeah, they're Jewish. Yeah, they're a serpent cult. But they were married in with all the Romans and the fucking Greeks. What does that make them in? Now you can't talk still about a Jewish conspiracy? The other fucking Jews, and there are millions through over any Judaism. Did you know that? And committed themselves to material development and progress, not just for themselves. If that was the case, Alexandria would have just been Jewish, wouldn't it? And every other town and city that Jews lived in would only been Jews. Where they succeeded, everybody else succeeded. Because they were watchmakers. They were jewelers. They were chartists. They were accountants. They were bankers. And what does a banker do? He lends you fucking money so you can have the next bank.
so you can improve your dastardly fucking state. You talking to me about Christianity and fucking Islam? Not going to happen when you really know the truth of history, right? Yeah, Jews are involved in a big conspiracy. Some are, yeah, like the Bolshevik Revolution, but they didn't create it. It's a group called the Black Nobility that you know nothing about. And it's these fucking Sabbateens who are already married in with Islam. Moved. That's why they moved east. They didn't move west. They moved east. And they are the ones who are now behind Christians, uh, they're behind uh, Islamo-communism. And Islamo-communism in its early days brought down at least one of the great empires of the world. Namely the Ottoman. But, you you know, the Russians were the most anti-Semitic country. And so you just don't know what kind of Sabbateans took revenge on the Tsar. There is a case to be made of that. I know Douglas Reed makes that case. Hey, it could be very, very true. But either way, never forget that the most anti-Semitic country that has ever been in the history of the world is Russia. Factor that into your geopolitics. The Jews did supremely well in the Aust Austro-Hungarian Empire. They were literally running the fucking place from the mercantile point of view. There's a level they couldn't go above. In Germany, the Jew was almost privileged. Bismarck liked the Jews and he took away all the sanctions against them so that he could be lent money by them, so he could fund his wars against Catholicism, because that's basically what it is. His Franco-Prussian war and his troubles that he had with Austria, and especially Hungary, the Jews helped him fund them. So Catholics have never forgot the Jews. Do you really want to come to the table? Do you really want to know the geopolitics? I don't think half this conspiracy movement is even interested. They've got their little Christian number. They've got their little Zionist number, blah, blah, blah. Jesus, I left out years ago. And so I've compressed the work of the greats. I cite them, you know, where they count, where there's accurate information, but I will fault them where there's not. And most of those writers do not ever mention Sabbateans. They never mention anything to do with uh, Frankists. They don't know anything about the female cult that came later. It says Freemasonry is Jewish. And that's all you need to know. It has Judaic elements because, as I said, they turn up again. The Gaionim turn up from Babylon, but there's as much Persian symbolism, there's as much, you know, Muslim symbolism <coughs> and other symbolism in Freemasonry as there is Jewish. Some bit more, some bit less. And there's lots of Templar symbolism. Uh, probably to equal any other kind of symbolism. But how many people focus on that? If you're going to focus on Jews, why are you not focusing on the fucking head of Akhenaten that's right in the middle of the Shriners? Why don't you decode what Scottish right really means and who that pertains to and on and on? We could go. And the proto-Templars, and you know. So it's not that there's no Jewish symbolism involved and there's no Jews involved. There are. But it's a much, much bigger story. And you need to know that bigger story to see if, if anything is really to make sense out of the whole thing. And there's an alternative give a few anecdotes already there's more on the way there's an alternative story of Jews I will not listen to any of these Jew baiters unless they know that story and since none of them do as I maintain in the opening of all of his programs people who don't like Jews and you know, know nothing about Jewish history nothing they know what they've read in the Bible and what they've heard from Ted Pike and you know some of these other types who just beat on Jews because they don't want you to know what Christianity is based in and these are agent provocateurs. I don't even care if they're Protestant. I got suspicions about them, the, even the Protestant ones, because Protestantism has been taken over years ago by the Jesuits and by the, uh, the Knights of Columbus and Opus Dei and all of that. So, and by the and way, you'll know a Protestant, you'll know a Protestant pastor because he'll be telling you the stuff I'm talking about. He'll have the real enemy in his sights. How about that? You mean he'll talk about like the Vatican because you'll have that obviously where everybody sort of agrees, yeah. even Catholics that I talk to agree about the Vatican. And, you, and when you're talking about all this and you're get you know talking about how people are misinterpreting these ancient texts like the Bible, like all these ancient things, they're forgetting the fact that we didn't get this pure these pure documents coming through. We got manipulated versions of corrupted older systems that were infiltrated by these very cults. And so you've got one group, you've got, you know, literalist Christians that are attacking Jews and Jews attacking Christians, attacking Muslims. Those three religions have been fighting and destroying this planet, fighting over this stuff forever, not knowing that they were all created and manipulated and infiltrated 
by the very same forces you're talking about. It all goes back well, well, well before. And that's where the, that's, the that process is how so much evil has happened under the watch of these so-called religious groups. The same with these medics. It's all hiding behind the light. It's not what you think. It's word manipulation. They've edited the shit out of a lot of stuff. And then, and then the priests come in and tell you how to read these books. But the real knowledge, if you were to take something like the Bible, for example, okay, because I personally have great respect for elements of the Bible and the Bible itself because of where it comes from, the, the history of it. And if you have the keys to read it, uh, you don't, it's a totally different book. It's a totally different idea. Actually, there's a lot in there because it was born from these ancient processes. So my take, I don't personally go out and attack a particular person as a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim or a, a liberal or a Democrat, because that is the game. When they start, you start identifying in their cults that they created through their disinformation agents, you're on their chessboard. You're on their game. And there may be a slight delay. See, they were able to infiltrate the Protestant movements very easily. Yeah, I know. You were breaking up pretty bad. Yeah, they infiltrated Protestantism. I didn't invent that. It's Malachi Martin and Father Alberto and these great writers who are telling you all about it. They get rid of Abraham Lincoln, right? They've done many, many machinations, some of the really big ones. And because they're internationalists, they have multiple Hydra ways of doing it. Now it's through communism. It's also through Islamo-communism, but we already mentioned that. So the movement of communism, you know, through the Frankfurt School people, and these are Sabbateans as well, religiously speaking, they, they owe nothing to no one and they have no loyalty to anybody. But they discovered finally through cultural Marxism, and Marx hated the Jews, so go work that out. He wrote books against them. You see, so, you know, have you checked out the Charles Moskowitzes and the people who write about that? No. You see, so the, the study is really immense. And they have multiple ways through banking, through education. They've got all their different ways. And they will take something that was pure from another culture and, and subvert it. Now, banking mm -hmm. is, of course, buy three houses for the price of one and all of that like stuff we know, right? And it's actually quite easy to overthrow any of that. But see, so there's nothing wrong with usury. Usury got poverty-stricken people out of dire straits when nobody else would help. That is a godsend. But obviously something like banking, just like we're talking about the cult of the medics, all those things could have been for the uplift of man. If man went homeopathic, he would know more about his body. He would have, just like Eustace Mullins mentions in murder by injection, our doctors would be all homeopathic, like Max Gerson and others like that, Raymond Royal Rife. And just like they say, all of these things, when a doctor who claims to be a vi virologist sees evidence of virus, it's just not what he thinks it is. It's parasites, right? So when you had a Raymond Royal Rife who had a Rife machine and Max Gerson who could put you onto superfoods or even ozone therapy or whatever you could name, people listening to this know what we're talking about, and even certain products just like chlorophyll or whatever, that will kill those parasitical the parasites in your body, which you know meat eaters or fish eaters might have more than vegetarians or who knows, right? But the thing is that that will take care of it. But we don't either give ourselves, first, we have no homeopathy to speak of, you really go search for that. And we don't give ourselves the time to heal, like I mentioned on a previous program, which could take weeks, months, even years. We don't have a medical environment that tells you about parasites or, in this case, out and out venom poisoning, which is nothing more than just any kind of food poisoning that another person in the East would get. Right? There's nothing, there's nothing bizarre about what Dr. Artis is talking about. It's only bizarre to a completely programmed, entrained population who don't even know anything about Jim Keith's electro, you know, radiotronic weaponry, ELF waves, they know fucking nothing, nothing. They're putting their kids 18 years under fluorescent lights. Open the fucking bathroom door, cabinet door, and let me show you how smart you are. Let alone your bloody fridge. Yeah, because they're selling you your What you're delivering yourself in, you know. Yeah. That's it. I mean, do you realize that when you walk into a pharmacy, Arnica, and that, that stops right there. That's about the most, and even that won't be fully natural, but you can stop it not. Just go up to, you know, toiletries and female tissues and, yeah, stick those on you with the chlorine and the bleach. and the, That'll be good for your pregnancy, won't it? Then you wonder why the kid's born half blind or 
sickly already after then they have more 18 jabs waiting for you look the damage is done by the woman in pregnancy forget what comes later forget all the vaccinations what you've sucked in with those nurses plugging into your body when you're pregnant is it and including the mri scans is already off the charts poison that i'm amazed any child is born in a good constitution and more and more of them are not that's why you can gender bend the shit out of them because they don't even know who the fuck they are they're in a diseased state the wilhelm reiches of the world and other homeopaths next week we'll do more on it thank goodness we have to keep up doing what we can with that subject because homeopathy is used against you in the negative way this venom is going around right homeopathically does anybody really know what that means or who invented the homeopathic it was a german and most of the original homeopaths in america were german and scandinavian with the ones who had come over to america were happy to use it did you know that the language of german lost by one percent as the national language of america one percent we spoke english it was german lost by one percent of a vote do you know what germany and the germanic peoples matter to america and its structures and its cultural elements it's not just beer but we've forgotten it all we're multiculturalized up the kazoo the white man doesn't even know shit about his own origin then he's going to talk to me about world history he's a christian is that is that the last that came out of europe was christianity that's what you know you wouldn't have socialism today without that bedrock there as kevin mcdonald has proven to you all the negative elements of a later era come into the genre come into our milieu because of the christian founding fathers and the pilgrim fathers who got their brains diluted by socialism as early as the 1700s and then they in comes masonry and you know we could go so there's something already in the bedrock of gentile white protestant america folks start fucking there but they removed the people who were trying to do that abraham lincoln was an enemy of the jesuits he was spending his life him and his lawyer to expose all the corruption from the trade unions onwards right from these little unions onwards lincoln's presidency hadn't even got started he was going to unhook the vatican's power in america did you know that and he wasn't the only one they got rid of him and they got rid of anybody else who looked like they were doing that but in comes nixon in comes roosevelt red phone the first ones to openly not only phone the Vatican and listen to the advice of the Pope, but to have the black Pope in the White House. Avro Manhattan, proven fact. Black Pope, these people were shunned by America. They were brought in by Roosevelt, and they were brought in by Wilson, and they were brought in later by Richard Buckingham Nixon. The red hotline to the... No decision was made in politics that the black Pope... And it's just some gangland killing that took Nixon out. Had he, had he stayed in presidency? Catholicism would have been made the order of the day, and that meant just more Jesuit colleges and more philanthropies, you know. And of course, the, the founders, did you know this, of the uh, Skull and Bones are all Catholics. Gilman and the rest of them, the actual founders of the Skull and Bones, just like the Bushes today, they're Catholic. And they're members of Skull and Bones. So that's that's your Knights of Malta. See, it's a like Grand Orient controls Europe for the Knights of, of Templar and Scottish Rite and uh skull and bones and the various ones we know in america they are the same organization the templar symbolism and even that pure atmos symbol can leave anybody in no doubt and if they are in doubt go to my sites female illuminati irish origins and start at one and go through it all and you'll come out the other end completely convinced because i didn't spend the last 35 fucking years studying this uh, to get it wrong doesn't mean i know it all right but I've, what I do know, I've presented in the most succinct fucking way, and you will find that it connects all the dots. There's not an aspect of the conspiratorial, you know, thought that doesn't come together. You know, some stuff we've talked about here, but a lot of other things that when you read it, you'll go, "Oh my God!" We haven't even talked about comets here or anything like that. So there's a lot of other symbolism throughout the Bible, throughout the scriptures, through the apocryphal works that brings in really odd things. But the oddest thing is the earliest, the early history of the genetics. But I didn't write it. Zachariah Sitchin didn't write it. He just translated it. It's there. And it's in multiple books of the old world. And it's also in the book of Genesis. And also in the book of Genesis is that the women are seduced by the angels of light 
but the women do not res uh, uh, do resist. That is something I got interested in. Why not? And I believe it was because of the seduction of power, which had been in the woman's psyche for a long time, but but had got now, you know, fully inflated. This and then they were given an un, un, they were given a weapon. It's like playing a video game. How many in the movie uh, with Orson Welles, the funny movie, uh, the movie the Third Man, and they're way up high in that uh, at the circus, and they go up in that wheel or the cable car, and he goes, "If I give you a thousand dollars for each of those little dots walking around there, how many dots do you think you could uh, sacrifice?" But I'm a humanitarian. Yeah, but if I give you $1,000 for each of those little spots, well, that's how they thought. And the women got the video game in their hands and just went, this is brain gas, kill them all. And it's in their psyche. Because you have to go into psychology to, to put together the Atlantis book. There's much more to it than other authors even know about. They're trying to write their books on the Nephilim. There's something oh, in the female psyche that was uh, manipulated here. And it's an instinct that's very strong today. It's in the feminist movement, and it's in a lot of women. It's in the, It'll be in all women until they route it out. Right? Now, I told you that it's actually ultimately nothing wrong with it. The envy is based in nature. Be angry with nature for giving man muscle endurance and tenacity. Okay? So that's where it originates. But just like any virtue, it can become a vice. And so a crime was done, and we've talked about this at the end of the female uh, sorry, Priesthood of the Illies and Eastern Illuminati and other shows. I've certainly done it in the premiums where that envy can be atavistically unleashed at any given time. So the symbolism that you see Madonna and these other plonkers, <coughs> Katy Perry, and right, those are put in by the media to activate the hatred of women against men. You couldn't have feminism of the 60s without it. So media is behind it. Because every so often, like with the suffragettes, some of this even has, you know, liberal elements that I'm for. I'm not talking about that level of just normal social reform. Jesus, no, the we manipulation. Need it. Yeah. But we don't need all the other things that come with it. You see, the venomousness, the, the violations, the politically correct person being the least politically correct, the socialist and the trade unionist hating his bosses, right? All of that, the left telling you that everybody else is evil, as they're doing right now in the streets. That's what I'm against the rabid fascism of these people and where that's coming from. But the thing is that that original hatred was co-opted. It's right there in Genesis. So I'm, we're not writing it. We're interpreting it. We're putting extraordinary pieces together. And then when you find that out, you discover then how the gene infiltration, you know, and the hybridization programs, which were done in the house of Ninlil, Ninti, as he's often called, Lady of the Rib. Like you said, I like the Bible because you can go back to its prototype and find out gems. How could you possibly have that knowledge at the house of Nin Ninti? How did she get it? They're either off-world beings, so that brings in the alien thing like nothing else does. Mm. Or our history on this planet is longer than we've been told, like the box saga people and other groups like that may hold, right? Either one is true. Take your pick. Either they are gods, like they call themselves and are. And key means for key is earth. An is heaven. So Anunnaki or Enki means from heaven to earth. Gods, they talk about it in the Bible, the chariots, they talk about the Vamana. These are not comets, mate. And these are not even delusions on comet after the comet struck. No, no. Comet is bad, real bad. But comet doesn't create the universal evil that we know today. And you don't get all of these other colorful elements thrown in when it's just comets bad as that is so you have to look elsewhere and you look to the ancient chronicles and you look to these ancient works and you know that they're only the remnant of thirty thousand works right. that once existed that we know that the vatican burned and these other places sequestered and all the catholic kings the scourging of europe by the titanic knights they're catholic the scourging the wholesale you know destruction of shrines and temples but Burger King, that you can leave looking at a, as a temple when shoving the fucking shit in, right there. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. Uh, jack in a box. And that jack in a box is an innuendo. Jack in a box is, is a sex act. Ejaculation okay. in the box. The box being the female womb. Like I said in the, uh, that's where they're all lining up. Right? And the, all the other symbolism that goes with it. And the ecstasy, like I said on the in the, in the ad copy, and the, you know, even the symbols, you see this ecstatic look when you're chomping down on that fucking burger. 
or you know the, on the on the Pepsi or whatever it is, the ecstatic look, you know, all the bubbles and the ice, that's occult. But you never ever question the chewing on the fucking, you know, chewing gum or whatever the fuck it is. Where's all of that coming from? And it's identified with a product, so you just bought it. You just that's, that's to sell that product. Madison Avenue is laughing at you. These yeah, products represent them. something. They represent a certain kind of product that once dominated our world for thousands of years, yeah, atavistically, right? So just, but the women are the doomsday weapon because the real atavistic attack is on womankind. That's how you get them to be what they are today. Pig ignorant, allowing their kids to be brought up where they've lost all their literacy. It's on their watch that they did it. And they themselves, have you ever seen any of them? And they, they awaken a lot of atavistic stuff, like the New Age did it, you know, with the goddess. So all of them could then have this giant girth size claiming that they're all some ancient goddess. No, but they all fell for it. Brilliant. Beauty not in anymore. Beauty doesn't reckon anymore. We've got to not fat shame your asses. We've got to transform our entire culture, courtesy of the script of the Frankfurt fucking school, to yeah, ultra-feminize everybody, and everybody's yeah. letting it happen because the estrogen in the fucking beer and, you know, on the foodstuffs and the programming from that fucking thing they call a TV has made man... He's, he's a eunuch again, you understand? He's been castrated. And nobody well, is doing anything about it. Because it is well, occult to that degree. But we'll leave it there. But again, hopefully we sketched in the foreground, the middle ground, and the far ground in this story. It's, it's fine. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Oh, man. There's so much there. That, we went four hours, man. That was epic there's so many links in there um follow up on what he's saying guys as michael was talking i was pulling up just links of random stuff he was saying i'd never even heard of before and lo and behold there it is the man's got a a lot of research and history and it's impressive how much you just have it stored and ready to go it's just incredible you get it even more in the books and the articles and if you want to go into it on a very deep level and analyze it come and join us over on unslave uh it's a premium membership but that's because we control that entire platform um, and uh, we need your help to keep it up and it's definitely more than worth it. So come and check it out over at unslave.com. And Michael, thank you so much for spending this time and, and breaking all this down for us today, man. And again, it might be a little delayed and garbled on your end. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you, everybody. You yeah, absolutely. No Thanks, guys. Uh, stay tuned for set. Yes, absolutely. Saturday night, uh, I'm going to be doing this part one on Mars with uh, with Josh. And so stay it's tuned Sunday. for that. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll catch you later. Cheers.